Hi, I'm Matthias. And I'm May. And this is a Q and A, which stands for questions and apples. I don't, I don't think that's right. Yeah, okay, no, it could be. It could be. Uh, what's what's a Q? So if Quebec we filmed apples? like literally two hours of you asking a question and me just pulling out another apple. Uh huh. And we just had a big pile of apples. We would have over two hundred apples because I think we had over two hundred questions. It would almost be like an art, it'd be almost like an art project to just yeah. come out and be like, what do you guys think about? And it's just like. It's apple. I just put down another apple and then you just go to the next question. There's meaning into, there's so much depth in the apple. Yeah. All right. So what's happened here is we've overrun our schedule and it conveniently happened about a year after the last time we did a Q&A. Yes. So hooray. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this process, CN Arsenal does a documentary series every other week, like. And it's a lot. Yep. Um, I'm honestly not sure how we like people are like, how do you do that? And I'm like, I don't remember how it, it I do it and I don't know how I do it because I'm usually spending at least 10 days on scripting mm -hmm. and then we put everything else together, you know? Well, it helps whenever the research you're doing has multiple guns that we're doing multiple episodes for. Yeah, that's why you see a lot of episodes where we try to get like the rifle and then the carbine. It really gives me a chance to get deeper into the material and not sort of work my fingers off. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but we've run into another situation where, especially because we're still sticking with World War One as best we can, with COVID, with everything else, uh, we just got slammed and have not been able to keep up our rolling schedule. So we're substituting in a Q&A. Yes, and these questions were provided by patrons or subscribe star people. Right. Um, so these are 100% from our supporters who we could not do the show without. Right. So, so thank you. So that's the other half of it. Um, yes, we need the time, and this is a lot faster to do. And then two, uh, we get to sort of interact with the community in a way that we don't normally get to because we are so busy. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're if you're on Subscribestar or Patreon, you had a chance to ask us these questions. The video is, of course, being made for everybody to see. Um, but when you're hearing these questions, I want you to understand the people asking them have funded the show. Yes. 95% uh, of what we do is paid for by... Uh, Patreon and Subscribestar. Mm -hmm. uh, YouTube ads are a very small portion of what we make. Oh yeah. Um, our merchandising is occasionally a medium portion, but not really the past year because again, COVID stuff. Right. The patron support is consistent. Right. Um, so these are the guys that we all need to thank. If you're one of the guys that's watching this series for free, say thank you to the patrons because they're they're making it happen far more than we are. I mean, we're oh, yeah. working. But we cannot financially exist without them. So Correct. very important people. Mm -hmm. So we're going to try our best to answer all their questions. Yeah. We limited everybody to one question. Some of you cheated. <laughs> Some of you might even get away with it because I got confused trying to get this put together. But <laughs> <sighs> anyway, um, we're going to go through 200 some odd questions. How many pages do you have there? Uh, 15. 15 Is it pages. cut off this time? Because the last time no. we tried printing it. Yeah, I tried printing it. For some reason, it really hated the idea that I was going to print it directly from Google Docs. So it like opened as a PDF and that PDF was cutting off. I had to save it from Google Docs as not, a PDF nobody, and then print from there. I didn't know we asked that question. I asked this question. Okay. This was my question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to get right into it. The last time we did one of these, it ran very long. You guys can see the time. We can't. It was three hours last time, so I wonder what we're going to be at this time. Yeah, this is like a marathon for May and I, and we've learned to pick up the pace a little bit, so I'm sorry if it seems a little rushed at first, but you'll see. We're going to start to get loopy here in a little while. They'll be all right. We'll get through this together. <sighs> I have coffee in the other room. <sighs> okay. I'm ready. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, yeah. first question. Okay, first question. Do you, I don't need to say the people's names, or I just ask the question. I don't. Should we say the people's names? I don't think so. Let, let's let's not because some I of these questions. Get, yeah, the, I, some of the questions were the same question, so we didn't include all the names for that same question. If you think about it, I also get weird about just reading off people's. I would assume people would put user accounts that they're okay with being public, but then now mm -hmm. I'm broadcasting. We're gonna leave the names off for now. I'm sorry, guys. If you really want your name said, I'm I'm actually sorry, but I always feel weird just bleeding people's names. Right. Yeah. So what okay. do we got? Uh, first question. I was wondering though if. I was wondering, though, if... Oh, there may be some uh, confusion here. Some people were doing establishing sentences uh -huh. that were very long. 
Uh-huh. Like they give you a paragraph. So, blah, 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 uh-huh. assuming you, uh, and it's nice for the context for us, but then trying to read it now is very difficult. So you're going to see a little bit of confusion on these questions. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, also, we kind of copy pasted some of the questions. So if some of you use grammatical errors or issues, I'm going to just say what's there. So that's going to be fun. <laughs> Maybe it's good we're not reading the name. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering, though, if an enlisted infantryman was able to purchase and carry his own sidearm or if there were regulations against this during World War One. Right. So could your average infantry do to have a pistol? I mean, they did typically anyway, but well, not was t- it like not personal? Typically, like, uh, I wouldn't say typical because you're thinking NCOs and things like yeah. that. Yeah. So officers can uh, usually, most armies, they're either issued a gun or they can purchase it themselves privately. Yeah. It creates their own ammunition problems. But generally that tells you how low down pistols were treated for a lot of things. Then you have specialty forces, so like Shoshaw gunners. They would be issued a pistol. Um, and then that was very important. It was critical to their their um, kit. Mm-hmm. But then you have this thing where it's like infantry. They're not issued pistols. There's no real system in place for them to purchase them usually. And the question is, did they really prevent them from purchasing them? And I think it was more just like the cost. They would have to be forking, the, or, um, forking up their own money. Most, so. most of what you'd happen is, what, you got to understand the economics of the time. Most people didn't really buy themselves guns very right. often, you know, maybe more in the American culture. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's very odd to have a firearm of your own. Not entirely odd. People bought them, but not to really. Right. As far as I've been able to find, because I've been trying to answer this question myself, I have not found any regulations that directly prohibit having your own pistol. I highly suspect that it was frowned upon because of various fears of um, rules of war, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. There's also sort of an organizational thing where you really don't – European armies especially didn't want individual soldiers. Mm-hmm. They wanted soldiers in the mass. I, I highly suspect that it was frowned upon. I highly suspect that it was seen as sort of an usurpation of rank because – uh, pistols were often an indicator of rank. And this is during World War One specifically, right. that block of period. So it couldn't even be like, was the Montenegrin, I remember at one point, oh, they, so that's you weren't a, that's allowed a, to have like long barrel pistols or long barrel revolvers. That's a very specific case. The Montenegrins, as a people, were all men were required to have a pistol. Right. So I'm, that's why I'm thinking they were, might be kind of different. In right. This oh, respect. yeah. They're going to, well, all Montenegrins will have a, a big revolver. Mm-hmm. Um, I know it's very common to see U.S. servicemen with handguns that they either acquired in the battle or managed to get a hold of that really they weren't supposed to necessarily have a handgun in their role. Right. Um, But then again, I think the U.S. is more handgun-centric. That's true. Um, So it's going to be different from Army to Army. But generally, I have not found an outright ban. But also generally, by a large majority of the time, infantry did not have personal effect handguns. However, that's probably more to do with, again, how many people had them before the war and mm-hmm. then the availability probably being directed more towards officers anyway. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're having a hard time getting enough pistols for your officers, you're probably not, you know... You're probably not dishing them out to the, the underlings. <laughs> right. Well, you're not. You're probably not giving them much opportunity to buy them because you're buying True. up everything. So what are they going to buy? But One th- more pistol in their hands is one less pistol in an officer's hands. That being said, when people do these archaeological digs or whatever, I have seen things like um, Belgian knockoff bulldogs and stuff turning up in British trenches, which is probably a sign not just of officers but of other people privately having them tucked away well, it somewhere. It was a war of attrition, so right. what did they get their hands on? And, you know, it, it, for officers especially, we'll see like personal rifles make it into the line mm-hmm. we'll see personal firearms show up in the line the problem is people really like talking about that but it's such an exception to the rule and it's very unprovable what was there right because it's so ad hoc mm-hmm. so i often get like well there's a photo of this guy who has this one particular hunting rifle it's the only one with that photo like the only one they could find of that instance right of it. and it just so happens it's some dude's hunting rifle he brought along so that they could get boar while they're at the front for fresh meat you know right and it's his personal decision mm-hmm. and it becomes very hard to track those because it's going to depend on whether or not anybody it's one of those weird things but there's the law, and then there's the application of the law. Mm-hmm. So even if I were to find and I have not found um, a ban on handguns, it would depend on how much that individual army really enforced that. So this is, gets into this one of those places of very conditional by the army, 
by by the country, by the the unit, by the command structure. You know, it, it gets very specific, and so it's a very hard question to answer universally. So, do you think we thoroughly tried to answer this question? No, I think I dodged it entirely because it's it's on it. It's not that it's unanswerable. It's just that it would require college dissertation levels of research to actually truly answer. That's fair. Does that make sense? Yeah, I get you. Yeah. I hate that. There's a lot of these little ones that I wish there... Anybody that ever wants to take up some of these things, by the way, always let me know. I'll point out any resources I got. Mm -hmm. um, there's also sort of an effect of how gun writers work, because we do the research on the firearms. And so we don't often have the all the side stories of the regulations, because the emphasis is on the firearm. Right, that's true. Yeah. So what okay. you got? Uh, next one. Do you know definitively that the uh, C-93 Borchardt was ev was never used in World War One, and if so, why was it shunned despite the pistol shortage? Right. Let's so, if you actually wrote yourself some notes here Yeah, as well. I got some stuff in case I get lost. But th this goes back to the first question. Um, it would have been private purchase because nobody issued them as standard. Mm -hmm. I think at that time maybe 2,000 had been made. There's not a terribly many of those. No, I remember that being a um, low number. Two or 3,000. I can't remember how many got made. But it's not like a million unit pistol. Mm -hmm. um, and then specific to Borchardt, you have the problem with its large size, great complexity, and um, its uh, – uh, my brain just locked down. Um, apples. Cartridge. Yeah, thank you. You're in the apples. <laughs> <laughs> proprietary, proprietary cartridge, right? Um, which is very similar to, but not the same as the Luger cartridge that followed. Mm -hmm. So, so it's not like it's a bad choice. Is the short answer? It's so, not cheap and easy to make, and then on top of that, the ammo that you get for it isn't something common and easy like thirty two. If you're an officer, you're going to pick almost anything else. Mm -hmm. If you're just someone who happens to have one and smuggle it to the front, it's very large. It's going to stand out, and you're going to have people being like, "Why do you have that?" And it's going to draw it's attention. It's not going to fit. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that's like there's a lot of little ways in which it's like mm, don't bring that, you mm -hmm. know, um, and so we don't see them. I don't know of any photo evidence of one, um, but again, proving a negative, you right. know, I, I see no photo evidence of X, Y, and Z until suddenly there's one just sitting in the back of a trench for some weird reason, yeah. but we never track down why or who. Hmm. So what else? Okay. Oh, God, it's a paragraph. All right. Uh, why were the French and British so resistant to adopting a standard semi-automatic pistol and kept with their revolvers? I know that both purchases some semi-autos, especially the Ruby by France. Um, but I think that's just working down the same question. I think is why were the French and British so uh, opposed to... I was going to read yeah. the whole dang paragraph. Well, he's trying to answer his own question because now he starts theorizing, but that's our job. <laughs> so um, it's not that they were resistant to semi-autos. French liked semi-autos very much. As a matter of fact, they had been developing semi-automatic yeah, yeah, guns. So. The problem with France is the Leviathan change. Um, France, in particular, is a standing European army with you know potentially millions of men under arms. Mm -hmm. So they have to they have to do everything by the times a million. You know, just whatever decision they make is 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 going to create this ripple effect. And so when they started the war, they had adopted a revolver that they were no longer producing all the way back from 1892. They'd stocked up on it and stopped producing it. Mm -hmm. They produced it at their state-run uh, uh, factories. That's the MLE 1892 you're talking right. about, right? Yeah. They, they, they would have produced it at their state-run factories, but in order to do that, they would have to free up machines and workers that could be making rifles. Mm -hmm. So then they said, oh, we can't do this. So we're going to need to just buy a handgun from somewhere. They went to Spain and attempted to buy uh, Spanish revolvers in their original 8mm ordnance cartridge. Mm -hmm. That worked, but the revolvers weren't great and there weren't a lot of them, you know. Um, but the, Spain was really good at producing this 1903 knockoff pistol, and it was available in 32 ACP, which is a cartridge that was already very popular in the commercial market, so they could buy the cartridge commercially. They could quickly have commercial manufacturing plants at home start making ammo. The, it was a, an available and easy to make ammo. Very easy to gear up for, too, it sounds like. Right. Um, so there's nothing proprietary about it. Uh, it was probably the most universal cartridge at that time. You know, we take it for granted that 9mm Parabellum is universal now, but at that mm -hmm. time, I mean, probably one of the most available sort of full bore pistol cartridges would be like nine millimeter Largo, you know, like Bergman. Yeah. And then everything else was specialty. The Luger had its Luger cartridge. The C96 had not even been converted to Luger yet. Mm -hmm. The, um, you know, you think about like the Steyr Hahn had a nine millimeter cartridge that was proprietary to it, you know. Everything did have proprietary nine mil. <laughs> yeah, 45 ACP really came onto the scene. It was older than that, but it came mm -hmm. onto the scene in 1911 commercially mm -hmm. in a way that people really resonated with. Um, 
So 32 is your most accessible cartridge in the market. And there were a lot of tiny pistols that had it right. already. So France did adopt a semi-automatic because they're like, we can get the cartridge fast, the guns can be cranked out of iron, let's go. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Or maybe soft steel. But, right. Um, so you see the ruby. And then post-war, France knows they need to go to an auto pistol, and they really just take forever to do it. But you don't see them adopting anything really different in the meantime. Mm -hmm. They stuck to a ruby or a ruby-like gun, and then eventually switched over to a full uh, – not full auto, but their own, you know, adopted 1935A. Right. So um, – and there's more nuance there, but you get the idea. For the British doctrine, um, they had never been able to get an autoloader – and we covered this in our Wedley Foster yeah. episode. They'd never been able to get an autoloader – to run 45 or 455. Um, and yeah, because the only uh, uh, semi auto I can think of is that self loader that we did that episode. Yeah, on. the Webley self loader and then the Fosbury sort of like attempted that. It's a that. weird, yeah. And then um, there were some contract 1911s that they managed to get to run that way. Right. Which, if they had done that sooner, um, they may have actually gone over to something like that because they were in the same camp as the US. They, the problem with them sticking with revolvers was really one of they wanted to have a knockdown bullet. They wanted a 45 caliber bullet, slow movie, heavy hitting, it's slow moving, heavy hitting. And that's hard to do in an automatic, um, which is why you only really see the 1911. Mm -hmm. You don't really see any other big bore 40 caliber plus guns running automatic cartridges. No, not really. At that time. So, um, and then once they're in the war, there's no way they're going to tool up for something else. No, they didn't have the time or the ability to. They did the Mark VI Webley during the war, but that's because Webley had already been producing those barrel profiles and everything else for the target world. They already had the machines ready to go, and they knew how to do them. So right. you could just do that. But introducing a totally new gun... Uh, would require a gear up that would have been impossible for them at the time for the manpower, for the money. Yeah. The only new guns you see during the war, realistically, are ones that fill a unique role. Um, actually, I think there's some more questions about that, so we'll talk about that in a moment. But that's, that's the only time you really see people try to reach and, and really reach for something and develop it. All right. So what do we got next? Oh, actually, um, uh, quick cut camera cool down. Oh, yeah. We're going to have pauses and stuff like that that'll happen uh, whenever we just need to run the cameras down. Okay. Alvin York and uh, Frank Luke are Americans that famously use their pistols in combat. Are they equivalent soldiers from other countries? These Man. are really, like, specific questions. Yeah. Though well, I put the specific ones up front. Oh, okay. It gets more personal the further we go in. That's why oh, okay. we're going to start by so answering... you're going to let us get loopy with the loopy questions, is what you're saying. So the very specific questions always require all the caveats, because there's only so much you can know. And so I put them up front so that I can sit here and do my hemming and hawing. Mm -hmm. And then the more we get into this, more deliberate it'll become because those are – the further we get in are the questions that have more answers, you know? Oh, okay, sure. So these are the hard ones. I started hard, so I would do this while I wasn't loopy. Um, <laughs> Look at you being smart. Uh, so the short answer is probably. However, there's some cultural differences that seem to get in the way of this. Uh, I don't know for minor countries mm -hmm. because I don't get a lot of information from them. Um, France is the most likely to have some actual descriptive text where you could find uh, national heroes representing what they did in more detail. Mm -hmm. However, I don't speak French and I haven't been able to read a lot of those very easily. I have... You said their names were redacted? Yes. So um, I'll get there in just a second. Okay. Uh, there's some mention of people actually talking about um, – what handgun they had in Britain, but they tend not to mention it in terms of what they're doing with it. So, they so just, you'll know the handgun, but you may not know what they're they doing. They don't necessarily with say it. that they ever used it, right? Oh, okay. Um, but what I really see from the Europeans more often than not is we see, and it may actually have a lot to do with sort of the post war analysis. Mm -hmm. When you look at the, the articles coming out of Europe at the time, and when you look at uh, the ones just after the war, um, a good source for something like this, I believe, is Review de Air. I think that's what it's called. I don't know. It's uh, the BNF has magazine archives, and if you can find magazines from the World War One period, they're kind of cool. Mm -hmm. But there was um, a La Vie en, en, en Air. I can't remember. I'll oh, find it. There's a bunch of French ones. Um, there's a French magazine series that started before and kept going through the war about air aviation. Mm -hmm. And remember, um, the pilots were the rock stars in those days. So it would be very rare to know the name of given infantrymen or whatever unless they were high officers. But when it came to individual pilots, we they were very clearly identified many times. However, the censorship boards got to it. So you'd read these articles and it'd be like, you know, pilot A blank and navigator, you know, C blank. And you're like, 
I don't know who that is, because what they're doing is they're trying not to tell the Germans whether or not they've killed certain pilots and navigators. Oh, that's smart. So you'll get these stories, and it's these are the, the only stories I've ever found where they're very descriptive about the weaponry are the aviators in France. And the reason they're descriptive, I think, is because it's special equipment. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're infantry, you just say, my rifle. But if you're an aviator, there's not an assumption that you have necessarily a rifle or whatever. So what they'll do is they'll say, I had my, um, my Browning. Mm-hmm. is a common one. Or they'll say, I had my Winchester. And that's as much as you get. You don't get, I had a Winchester in 1907. You know what I mean? You get, I had my Winchester. Right. But they'll say things about how many rounds they fired or what the magazines or clips were or whatever. And you can get a feel for like, he's got a Winchester in 1907. Mm-hmm. Um, that's as good as you can get on those stories. And I've seen a couple. I've seen a German mention having an Auto 5 in a plane. Cool. I've seen the French. I've seen several accounts where it's clear that they're talking about, um, like, a Winchester repeater. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I've heard a couple of accounts where they're talking about their specific handguns. And you can kind of figure out what pistol it would be, depending on the army and how they're describing it. Sure. And that's about it. The problem is, oftentimes, the names are redacted. Mm-hmm. And, and then they're not even telling you, usually, the model of whatever gun they have. Right. And then, also, they didn't have this post-war culture that the U.S. does. Because the U.S. Um, had cowboy stories. Famous? No, I think it's a West... It's a, it's a very... I don't know how to explain it. The U.S. loves marksmen. We love firearms. We love that sort of thing. So when you have a post-war account of someone doing something daring in the French army, you often have conversations about the the mechanics of the plane or the the ground conditions, and they just sort of say, my rifle, Mm -hmm. you know, and they might say my pistol. They don't get into the details like we do. I don't know how to explain it. Okay. Um, so that can be harder. Although I'm sure there are accounts where if you were to go find them and piece them together, you quickly start to see. Um, I know we mentioned a couple in our 1907 episode. Yes. And I think we even found one that may have been an FN 1900, a copy of the Remington Model 8. So there, there's some named things that happen. But we turn around and for all those instances, I had one article that I read in which um, a machine gunner, bought uh, what he called a Winchester 1887, but then when he described it, I think it was actually a 1901, and it's it's a lever-action shotgun. Both of them are near identical. It's just... I think I remember you telling me right. about this. There's a whole account of it, and because he's an American, he's talking about the length, the action. He's talking about where he bought the shot, what kind of shot it was, how beautiful the gun... Like so he's, all the details right, about the gun. He's describing the gun in so much detail, and I'm like... Actually, that's probably 1901, but he just called it an 87 because that's what he knows it as. Right. Like, it, that much detail is there because it's an American. He's talking about the gun, mm-hmm. you know? So it, I think a lot of it's just the culture of whether or not you carry those those details over in the narrative. Fair. Yeah. Sorry. Long explanation. I mean, I understood. Yeah. All right. Next question. Um, I know during the Great War, there were mining parties on each side. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, tunnels. What sort of weapons would the parties carry into the tunnels? Have you found any reliable information about equipping sabers to fight enemy sabers? Or no, sappers. Sappers. Sappers, sorry. I thought I read sabers. The diggy boys. Yeah, okay. So what, he's, what this is referring to is you would tunnel under your enemy's position, set charges, and then get out of there and detonate them, and boom. And there's right. some spectacular examples of this. But both sides are doing it, so there are times in which you run into each other and you have a... Tunnel cross. Yeah, you are in a gunfight or a knife fight or what. You're in a fight in a little cave underground that you dug yourself. Oh, God. So nobody's throwing hand grenades, I hope. That would be awful. That'd be you taking yourself out in the process. Yeah, I don't think anybody's that daring, but uh, maybe. Um, Generally, you would want a fighting knife or a pistol. Those were the two things that they wanted the most. Again, like we said, pistols are not that common in Mm -hmm. the trench. So a lot of people are really obsessed with the idea of trench carbines. Um, and the idea is that you would have this cut down Obrez style gun. I have found only two accounts that give credence to this. Um, no, this was two accounts just you came across in your research? Yes. Okay. Um, so far. One is a physical example, um, a cut down U.S. 1917 that was found in German possession at the end of the war. Hmm. Um, and I think I have... So, uh, you know, we, that's going to be discussed on a future episode, actually. Sure. Uh, because the other thing I found is, uh, I believe Skennerton has an account from an armorer. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, the account doesn't make a lot of sense. Or no, it was somebody who said he went to an armorer. And he said, it was an officer that said, we took over 
this we took over a damaged end field and we had him do this stuff to it. Okay. And then his description doesn't quite work. The way he describes it, you're like, you're like, wait, wait you can't do both of these things, but we get the gist of it. Mm-hmm. And in theory, uh, he had three guns made that were cut down short magazine Lee Enfields. The interesting thing is he very specifically says that they kept the full stock. And yet whenever you hear these rumors about these guns, it's always an Obrez with a pistol grip. Yeah. I, I guess I could see a tunnel being the only place in which an Obrez would work. However, as much as I see these things in museums and stuff... I've never seen them properly, provably put into a World War One trench. I have seen two that are put into a World War One context clearly, mm-hmm. both of which had full stocks, but were just very short guns. Right. So um, we're actually going to try to do like a little episode on that at some point. We mm. have a someone donated. It's been a while, unfortunately, but now it's actually sitting with a, a machinist friend of mine, so it's moving finally. That's good. Um, we have a highly ratted out. Lee Enfield. I mean, just irrecoverable as it originally was. And so that gun is being trimmed to match the specifications from this story, plus some smudging, because you if you literally did just what this guy's story was, it, it won't wouldn't work. work. Right. So we're trying to figure out, like, maybe what, what the closest thing yeah, to that would... Yeah, like getting it to that point, to at least as close as possible at that point. And so we'll play with that and we'll talk about it, but the, as far as that goes, it's one of those things that's a big story and yet proof is like nowhere. Mm-hmm. And that might be because it didn't really happen often, which is probably very true, but it also might be that when it did rarely happen, you didn't really want to tell anybody that you defaced a perfectly good service rifle. Right. So it, there's reasons why you wouldn't necessarily communicate that all the time. I get that. All right, let's see what's next. Um, Why does the Luger and a few other handguns have a trigger that is almost a complete circle? Does that extra part above and ahead of where your finger hits serve any purpose? Are they talking about like the seer connection there? No, the way the Luger is, it has a very pronounced moon-shaped trigger. Yeah, I mean, I knew that, but when he's above it... it, Where it connects to the seer, there's usually like... Like, my connection to the seer is here. Like trigger bar or something? Yeah, and then the trigger keeps curving... Sorry, trigger. Yeah. So usually this surface here, what it's doing is it's tapping out against the frame to prevent over-travel forward. Because you're, you're springing the trigger outwards. Mm-hmm. You pull against that spring. And then when you let go, it snaps forward. Usually that over-projection, in most cases, is where it bottoms out. Okay. Um, it may also just be a balance thing. You know what I mean? So that you have some mass on either side of the tipping point. Mm-hmm. There, there's a lot of reasons why those ergonomics come about. Um, beauty, balance feel and then also sometimes just the ease of machining and polishing it may be that the way they set everything up it just worked out that that was the easiest shape to come out with i've noticed a lot of early trigger guards are perfectly round Mm -hmm. because perfectly round is a pleasing shape weird oblongs are not a pleasing shape and but ergonomically they're easier to use when they're that oblong because you can wear a glove even but when you're selling a premium pistol instead of a dirty revolver you're selling this like you know, because the expenses are much higher. Mm-hmm. There tends to be this sort of, like, desire to be a uh, nouveau, you know what mm-hmm. I mean, to have some styling to it. And it has, it has to be aesthetically pleasing to the right. eye. And then it gets out in the service, and then they go, Ugh, and they cut it wider because <laughs> gloves. They're like, oh, so no. A good, a good example is, that. like, early and late Nambu Type 14s. Yes. Perfect circle, and then later on they're like, ah. And then, <laughs> we need to be able to use gloves and stuff, man. It's cold in Manchuria. Give me a bigger thing. <laughs> And it looks, it honestly looks hideous when they do it, too, yeah. but who cares? It's a military right, weapon. Right, it's got to be so, functional. Yeah, that's nine-tenths of it, though. It's styling, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. All right, let's see here. What's next? Um, what do y'all, y'all, mm-hmm. I know where you're from, uh, reckon is the best stocked pistol of the war? I don't know. Do you know what, I what, mean, we haven't shot really... Two. I've shot two. Yeah, the C96 shot, and the Luger. You've shot... More stocked pistols than that, though, because you've shot, like, a stocked English high power. Yes. You've shot a stocked 1911. Yeah. To One be fair, that was fun. I would like fun. to talk about. That's not even a thing, but it's fun. Yeah. Um, so we have actually shot several stocked pistols. The problem is, as far as World War One goes, the big ones you think of are the Luger and the C96. And then if you're picking between the two, you have to go with the Luger, right? Because you can do that trauma mag setup, and that's more rounds. The magazine setup's just superior on the Luger. Right. Um, if I'm doing a, a combat weapon... Between magazine set up period and wins and then honestly a number of rounds you can have with that crazy easy to pick safety is a little more usable yeah like I just I mean it's not terrible in the C96 but it's just Luger's a little bit better right um but then the problem is there's stock pistols we have not handled right. that would have been exceedingly rare in the war 
probably the most common stock pistol you could have encountered that we have not handled would be like a stocked uh, Steyrhan. Oh, that'd be fun, yeah. I don't... I'd love that. I see how the stock goes on the Steyrhan. It's kind of like a cup. And it looks like it's probably uncomfortable, but the Steyrhan is such a good gun. Did the stocked ones have that fixed lanyard at the bottom? Yeah, it goes through a cup. It's weird. It's like a little... It's like a cup holder in your car and you just stick the gun in there. So it's just like a cup holder except it's for really, Steyrhan's? Yeah. So, um... <laughs> what is that? I suspect that I would like a stock Steyrhan better than any of the other stock pistols, but I don't know. I haven't handled just, one. I would, to be fair, I love the Steyrhan. That would yeah. just be fun. Oh, yeah, I would love that. And then, um... So there, the Germans got a hold of Bergman 1910s, which mm -hmm. we haven't covered yet. Uh, if anybody has one, please loan it. Um, <laughs> some of those were available stocks, but I'm not sure if any of them really made it in German hands that way. Mm -hmm. But that's a stocked potentially pistol. And then it was after it was post war, but didn't the Smith and Wesson number three end up with a stock at one point? No, it's way before the war. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but those were not military issued that way anyway. Yeah. And then they would have been a rare. That's a really rare thing. That's a single That'd be action fun. only. Um, that's true. But in terms of pistol pistols. Um, FN 1903s had available stocks, but that was also very, very rare. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the big boys, you're really thinking C96, Luger, Steyrhan. Um, unless I'm really missing something, which I could be. But Oh, um, there's a very – it's a rare pistol. Um, you know this uh, Webley self-loader we did? Yeah. There's a cavalry version with an adjustable rear sight and a stock. Oh, okay, sure. Which could have been really cool. Uh, those things are extremely rare, and I have not been able to handle them. That probably makes that gun much nicer to use, actually. Yeah, I would love to try that stock. So, um, but from what we've done, Luger, yeah. I, from theory, probably, unless maybe. there's something I don't understand about Steyrhan. Yeah, maybe Steyrhan. Yeah. Uh, the loading on the Luger is still better. Yeah, it's still better, but Ergo's on the Steyrhan. And then and round then. capacity again. Ah, I, still, I think I'd pick mm. the Luger. Maybe, yeah, okay. Um, let's see your next question. Excluding the 1917 revolvers, how common was the use of speed loaders for revolvers during the war, and how many would one typically have? They really weren't common. Uh, you have war. one. <laughs> if you had one, you had one. Yeah. Usually. Um, we've talked about these a little bit, but the big ones were like the Prado and the Watson. Mm -hmm. um, for, and that's it. It's really like, if you think about it, it's British speed loaders. Mm hmm. And then the U.S. speed loaders mm -hmm. for the stripper uh, for the uh, uh, revolvers, no, the moon clips. Yeah, um, and that's it mm -hmm. for revolvers. There's others that existed and could have been done, blah, right. blah. Mm, right? And I mean, there's even like the Webley Fosbury we talked about it, like that weird little moon clip right. that, that, that looks like a saw. So what you're really looking for is. Um, the Prudo, the Watson, and like the 1917 are probably the big ones. Yeah. Um, and I don't even know how many Watsons were around by then, but the Watson was like a milled affair. You took it out, you put it in, you twist the thing, I think. I think it's a twist. And then you like pull it back out and it's on a lanyard so you don't lose it. Then you throw it back in on your, you either drop it or so throw it on your side. So is the lanyard like, like hooked onto you? Yeah, yeah. You have a cartridge pouch with the Watson attached to it okay. so that you didn't lose the Watson. Sure. Um, I think Prudos had the same option because you would reuse them. So it's and that's the and that's why you probably only have one. Um, in the U.S., we didn't reuse them. We just throw them in there, and boom, 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 and then kick them out, and right. then you just and all your ammo everything came on it. Yeah. So when you ran out of those, you just were, or you were out of ammo. You would well, no, you probably get like. <laughs> Did two, you have Lucy's? I think it was like something like you get two. Well, they came in half moon clips, so they packed right. flatter. So you'd have a certain number of those, and then you'd have loose rounds if you wanted. Okay, sure. But if you're down to loose rounds because you've multiply reloaded it's your pistol, a bad time. you're in a bad place for warfare. You know? <laughs> so generally, as far as I understand it, the people who privately purchased the Prudos and stuff would have one. Yeah. Um, I, it'd be weird to have two because it's a lot to carry around. All right. What's the next question? Uh, do we want to take a break and cool the camera off and yeah. get back on? We'll just keep we'll just keep cutting them where we gotta cut them. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Um, next question: Have you seen any training materials on the Steyr Han, either from the manufacturer or from the Austro-Hungarian army, that indicate how it was meant to be carried? That one I would have to look up if I'm honest. I'm sure it exists because there's a beautiful um, Austrian handgun book series that I've been you know, slowly translating through as I need it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I can speculate wildly. That is always fun. Yeah. I mean, I enjoyed your uh, wild speculations. <laughs> without documentation in my hand, I guarantee, well, I don't guarantee, but I highly bet that the general way of carrying it was um, empty. And in other words, uh, people were wondering, they're wondering how you carry it as in like, what state is the gun in? Right. I would say generally most pistols would be carried empty chamber back in those days. Right, because that was common. 
However, the Steyrhan is pretty weird because the way you stripper clip load it, it wants to feed that first round. You kind of oh, have yeah. to really want to. So I almost suspect the Steyrhan was going to be one of those pistols that's more often carried either completely empty and you would mm -hmm. load it at a time, which is wild. But not weird, because it's designed to unload itself, too. We saw that right. spectacularly. Mm -hmm. So it may be that they expected you to have it loaded right before a battle or before you went up to a front line or yeah, something like that. Maybe like, like they, were, they would get them ready as they're about to head into the battle right then and there. You could also, uh, there is room to th finger the round down and, and go empty chamber. It's awkward, but yeah, you can do it. But it doesn't really lend itself to that. Mm -hmm. So the Styrohan's probably the most likely handgun in Europe to be carried with a live chamber cocked and locked which I highly expect is how it was carried for cavalry. Oh, yeah. Um, because they'd expect it to put it into use very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, as far as officers, I'm going to bet that's probably more down to their independent... Preference. Yeah, preference. preference, yeah. But it is such a curious one that you asked the Steyr on, because that is definitely a gun like the C96 that is difficult to actually ready right. with an empty chamber. So... I don't know. That's a, yeah. I'd have to double check. I'll, I'll keep an eye out for that paperwork next time I get into this, some of the... Um, Austrian, Austrian guns. Hungry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, let's see here. Next question. Excluding the 1911 and Luger, what period sidearm would you have been, would you want to have to defend yourself? Okay, what did I exclude? Let's see here. No 1911. No. Yeah, no 1911 and no Luger. Let me look here. I think I had a note. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, we've been talking about these things. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, we literally have been. Uh, well, I'd go for a stocked pistol because then I get a carbine. Right, you so, get that option, which like, you're not going to turn that down. If I get the Luger with the stock, I'm going with the Luger. Well, he just said excluding the 1911 and the Luger. Oh, uh, C96 with a stock. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. And there was Steyr Han with the stock, like we talked about before. Yeah, Steyr, cool. Steyr Han with a stock would be cool. And then, honestly, just Steyr Han in general would be my next choice, I think. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have a detachable magazine, so I guess... <sighs> If I really want to, so the problem with detachable mag is it's nice for us nowadays because we'll carry two, three mags. Mm -hmm. That almost never was the case. You might have one spare mag. So if you get a stripper clip pistol from that period, though. How many stripper clips? Yeah, you see, get? you That's get the ammo issued on clips almost. So, so how many of those clips were you issued? That's ah. my thing is, I, do I want to just get one quick reload maybe if I have the second mag? Or do mm -hmm. I want the ability to sort of have a bunch of medium speed reloads? But Steyrhan's pretty high up there. Um, if I yeah. really think about combat pistols of World War One that I find to be modern and reliable, mm -hmm. that are automatics, it's not that I hate the Ruby or anything like that, but it's a no. blowback 32. I'm not also, you can't swap mags on the Ruby, right? Not unless it's from the same manufacturer. Not even then. Even then, even then it gets okay. funky. Like it's hard to get spare mags. Because we tried for that. We literally did test it on range, like three different mags in it, and the only one that yeah. worked was the one it came with. No, and also thirty two ACV, blah blah blah. Yeah. So um I really like the if you're thinking about like guns that have oomph, he's right, nineteen eleven and Luger stand out. Mm -hmm. C ninety six stands out. Yep, Steyrhan stands out. Yeah, Steyrhan stands out more than the C ninety six. And then like the nineteen oh three maybe? Um, FN? Yeah. Yeah, 9 millimeter. Well, because it's 9 millimeter browning, but it's still a blowback, but it's it's a hunky blowback. Right. I, I would trust 9 millimeter browning. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. We're really looking up at our yeah, pistols. Yeah, I know. I'm looking at the pistols over here. It kind of has a good, nice little uh, sheet. Webley isn't self loader, it? not so much. No. Uh, just something. It's a cool gun, but there's something about it that seems unnecessary for what it's doing. Yeah. Um,. No, I think, I think like Steyrhan, maybe FN 1903. Yeah. Those are two Everything really good picks. Everything else is like 32s or just I weird functionality. I'm sure we're forgetting. It's not the Glacenti. I know that. Not the Dryza. <laughs> maybe in 32, but dang, if everyone can't drill a hole with that thing. <laughs> the best 32 is like the Savage 1907, I think. Oh, yeah, with 10 rounds. Yeah. Like, that's pretty dope. Yeah, if I'm, that's probably the most usable Plus, 32. it's pretty savage looking. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um... Have y'all ever shot a Martini Henry or similar firearm, and do you know if it serviced in World War One? Yeah. yeah, we actually have. Mm -hmm. We've already yeah, filmed fun. some stuff. No, we haven't. Yeah. Well, did we? Oh yeah. Wait. Whisper. What? Whisper. I'm not whispering it to you. You should know. Oh, it's been a while. It's to been be fair, years. It's a Q and A. You can just tell them. We've already filmed um, <laughs> a spectacularly rare. Uh, uh, Ottoman conversion one. Oh, right, yes. We've already filmed an Ottoman Type 1, like a, a, an OG 1874 Ottoman in its own unique cartridge. So be jelly. That's already been shot, um, and the footage is there. It might even roll into a minute of May before the episode at this yes. point. Yes. Because... Along with any other potential renders. Oh, you know, there's a question about this later. So I will tell you why you haven't seen the martinis yet in just a moment. But the Ooh. short answer is... Um, 
we are covering the martini. It did have some use in World War One, and we will contextualize all of that in probably what's looking like maybe three or four episodes, because there's a lot of martini history that really doesn't get talked about, and I'm sure it's going to be another one of those crag things where, like, a quarter of everybody gets irritated, but then the <laughs> other three quarters are like, yes, keep going. They're just like, please give us more. And I, I'm sorry, I know you guys don't always like the super daisy chains, but, God, they make my life so much easier to just, just like, pile up the same research well, topic. Well, so you kind of just get to keep going with the research and actually get all of it out, as opposed to having to try to condense it even further in, like, a single singular episode. There will be a martini bonanza at some point. Woo! There will also be a 19... Well, we'll talk about that later. Oh. What do you got? Let's see here. Uh, where are we? There we go. Between the trapdoors, or the trapdoor Springfield, the sharps, and the rolling block, which would you take in 4570? Okay, so rolling block, trapdoor mm-hmm. Springfield, and... And sharps. What's your call? I mean, the rolling block is the only one I'm particularly familiar with. Yeah, uh, just personally for the fun of it. I mean, if I'm it's doing very, 40, it's if very... I'm shooting 4570, I'm probably going to get the trapdoor just because. But in terms of actually fighting, um, probably the rolling block. And all, mostly because it's perfectly fine at doing what it does. It keeps up with the other two. Mm-hmm. And then it's light. It is. The rolling blocks are extremely light for what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I have to march, I'm taking the rolling block. If it's a single shot, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, I'm going to get into one of those weird kind of fights, and I'm not going for like... I think the rhythm on the martini can get a little faster than a rolling block because you get the mm-hmm. tray, you know what I mean? Or like early bolt action single shots like the Burdan are really good. But mm, from this list, I'm going to probably go with the rolling block. Now, you're saying light, but I do remember that French 1915 rolling block being surprisingly dense for how oh, yeah, no, for how thin it is. Not compared to the trapdoor and the other yeah, stuff. Yeah, I guess that's true. Like, it's just... Mm, the only the only time I would really consider a single shot to be better is if it has a quicker loading system. Yeah. So the martinis can be fast, the Burdans can be really fast, um, you know, like the Gras can be fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- especially compared to the rolling. I think that's yeah, you the, can basically the big, throw it and go. The big failing of the rolling block is this this that weird sort of like kick kunk, all these motions. Yeah, you have you to have click to make. past the first cock. Like you you literally hit, click past the first the half cock in order to get to the full cock position. Yeah. Trying to think the trapdoor. No, you still have to. Mm, yeah, rolling block. I'm just going to go with rolling block, but there's other single shots I like better than that, too. That's fair. All right, let's see here. Um, is there any good source of reloading data and information for obscure black powder and transitional car- cartridges, such as 11 millimeter Mauser, 8x50R Monlicker, 8x56R Monlicker, oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, sure. Um, you have to dig <laughs> and then trust but verify. Um, actually, hand loading is getting to be a. I think hand loading is going to be a very big thing in the next market. Yes. Um, Considering. And I think uh, we have a question about this coming up too, but uh, hand loading is going to become far more central to gun collecting than it has been before. And I think um, you're going to start seeing a lot more information surfacing in the next year about it. Yeah, we have um, some behind-the-scenes conversations going on with our current hand loader. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a company that is working with him to potentially gear up a series. Yes. The series is probably not going to be on YouTube because of YouTube's rules. Right. But we will tell you about it when it is ready. And the plan, as it is laid out, is to uh, do two things. Mm-hmm. One, literally... Yesterday, I was in a meeting with him, and we came up with a simple five-step system. That system's not polished, so I don't want to tell you everything about it, but we basically are trying to come up with a, like, how to orient yourself towards reloading for a specific old gun, Mm -hmm. because a lot of the hand-loading community now loads to the ammo, not to the gun. Um, and that can have dangerous consequences. Yes, especially when you get into things like Gavari 88s, where I get emails all the time like, which bullet do I use? I'm like, slug your bore. Mm-hmm. If it's a Gavari 88, slug the bore. I don't care what the markings are, because I've had all sorts of people in my inbox disputing the Spitzer markings really being true on their gun. Right. So when it's a Gavari 88, slug the bore. <laughs> and so in that sort of vein, um, our hand loader David's really looking at uh, coming up with a system mm-hmm. um, that is very easy to remember and then doing a series of videos on how to do that system and then once that's all laid down he would like to then give out very specific load data because the current problem is if you just hand out load data um, a lot of people are worried about liability because you'll right. say this is how you load 8 millimeter Mauser and then they'll shove it in a Gavari 88 mm-hmm. right? and so he wants to have an overarching system in which he can say don't forget 
this acronym that we came up with. You must identify the, the, the gun properly before you do the next thing. So that whole system is in the works. Um, and until then, unfortunately, you're just going to have to get your kind of feed in into the reloading communities that are and available. double check, trickle, triple check your own gun before you go throwing anything in. Yeah, the good news is, according to David, who does most of this work for us, um, if you go and ask in any of the reloading forums, any they of the all communities, seem super helpful. Yeah, the ones that are helpful, will, you will know right away because people okay. will just step in and help. They're very interested That's in keeping great. the hobby going. Okay. So it's very much you're going to have to rely on the community, and you're also going to have to do some measuring yourself. Yes. So not an easy answer. Sorry. About no, that. but it's going to get easier probably by this time next year. Good. All right. Let's see here. Next question: Why was the Mosin's bolt handle so short compared to other rifles of the time? I suspect it, <laughs> I suspect it was probably justified in various ways. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to even think about it. I guess I never really thought about it. It's very stubby, and you don't get a lot of leverage I out of it. I guess no. So. They have, the Mosin has, and I get yelled at from my Mosin episode, I don't care. The Mosin has some of the highest number of drag surfaces, I swear to God. Mm -hmm. Like, the bolt is not good uh, at... It's not good at primary extraction. No. It has it, but it has it sort of late. Like you start moving it and then it starts kind of cam. It's it's a little bit of a delayed primary extraction. Um, it's got all these engaging surfaces where there's like slop that can get into the system and mm -hmm. it gets kind of rubbery. And so then you put it in there with a little stubby bolt. And it's like if you just had like, <laughs> three, if you had like another inch off the end of that thing, you could just, it'd be so much better. Right. Um, You'd have a much more leverage point. I suspect I material you. consumption, not having it stick so far off the gun that's in the way. And then also, uh, if you look at the Burdan before it, the Burdan had a very short bolt. And it did, yeah. And it was very tiny, too, the bolt handle. Yeah, the Mosin bolt not. is actually sticking out a little further than the Burdan, I believe. And then I don't, I don't so know. So they see that as a proof and they're like, yeah, we did better. I've actually <laughs> been researching the Burdan lately, and I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure why the decision was made to do this other than uh, economics, which makes uh -huh. a lot of sense. But the Berdan bolt is like a separate piece that's keyed in there. And so when you do that, you might not want to have like a big lever sticking off because you're making this little thing and plugging in there. And, boop. and so like I suspect the Berdan bolt was short because it sticks up and mm -hmm. because it's a separate piece. And then they got used to that length. And so when they made the next one, they're like, mm, we can make it a little longer, but we don't want it in the way. It don't need to be that much longer. Especially because the Berdan has that weird 30 degree bolt or whatever. Yeah, it's like you bolt it down and you're like, wait, is okay, yeah, that is as far as it goes, but it's like but off if, and it, up. It's like 45 about, degrees. If you think about marching around with that thing, not being a 90 degree bolt, it doesn't stick out very far. No. So then you go to a 90 degree bolt, Anything that sticks out further than the Mosin bolt is going to be like, why is that sticking out like that? We didn't have to yeah, do with this it. This is really I, far I, out. I, I bet. I don't. I can't guarantee any of that, but that's my you suspicion. You can just see someone being like, no. Yeah, just momentum. Yeah. All right, let's see here. Um, next question. Outside of specialist personnel like snipers, do you know how often precision sights, windage, etc., were adjusted in combat, or did troops tend to just set them before a battle and then leave them alone during a fight? Uh, for most large armies, site changes were ordered at the um, start, sort of command level. Right. You know what I mean? Like, or officer level. Like they're know? about to roll into it and they would then order everyone, set your shit for this. Well, no, they would do it on the fly. Like you could get in there. So a lot of this comes from Plevna. Um, and I want to talk more about Plevna because there's some controversy. Siege of Plevna. There's some controversy about Plevna in terms of the repeating rifles. But the one thing that everybody agrees with on Plevna is and this is the Russian seize of the Turkish forces, right? And the Turkish forces in defense just mowed down Russians. And the one thing that they agree on, um, and most people dispute the, the Winchester repeaters involved because those were supposed to be short range repeaters. That a lot of countries left Plevna going, We want repeating rifles because of those Winchesters, even though it looks like they really didn't do much. The, mm -hmm. the sort of the lore said that they did a lot to certain countries, but the one thing that everybody did notice on top of that that was very real is that the Ottomans had done a very good job of pre-ranging everything. So they knew that rock is this far away. They knew it's like two football fields, right? They knew their sectors of fire. So it's like, you're here, you cover this. Right. Mm -hmm. And then they had, uh, so they did a good job pre-gaming. Yeah. They had Peabody martinis that were sighted 300 yards further. Well, roughly, cause it's like their version of paces and the Russian version of paces, but they're started, they're sighted about 300 yards further. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is theoretically the Burdan rifles cartridge, was the better performer for flatter trajectory and longer range, 
but the guns were not set up for those ranges. Mm -hmm. And so um, in Plevna, the Russians were outranged by a gun that shouldn't have outranged them because of differences in doctrine. So because of that, going into the war of, you know, 1914, yes, a lot of units were very well trained to, uh, by their officer's command, pick a range distance, set their sights to that range. And you'll even see more advanced concepts in which it's like these guys are ranged for 200 meters on this sector over here because there's a tree line there. But then this opens up. So you guys need to set out the 600 meters and open fire if they come into five or what, you know, you start, you get into this stuff. Um, and it's usually much more organized by subsections of the group at the smallest. It's not okay. normally one guy. If it's one guy, he's sniping. And that's mm -hmm. very specific to him. All right, next Very question. Cool. All right. All right, let's see here. Why were there so many bizarre scope mounting systems before the world settled on mounts wherein the bottom screws on top of the receiver, the top wraps around the scope? I feel like the answer revolves around stripper clips. This is what they're saying, uh, which makes even less sense to this person for a rifle like the SMLE. So the problem with optics mounts in World War One is they were new. Um, wasn't really something ever anyone had pre-gained. Well, the optics themselves were all over the place in terms of their rigidity or strength or, you know, adaptability. Yeah, it was a new concept. They weren't sure what would work. Well, glass was, it, it was very new science. And so a lot of it was you go with what works until it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, you have armies trying to figure out how to use uh, chargers or um, they would really want to make sure the iron sights were still available, but then other countries didn't care as much. You know, is it, we still do this today. Do you, do you have backup irons on your AR? Is that critical or is it negligible? Mm -hmm. You know, and so there's a lot of that. So some of it's keeping them out of the way of the iron sights. Some of it's allowing room for loading. Some of it's specifically bolt handle throws and stuff like that getting in the way. Mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of it's just that they really were taking from the commercial market which was a hunting market, which didn't have the same concerns as a military market. And so that's why you start to see this, like you're borrowing heavily from a commercial market and then you're trying to adapt it to a military use. And then you start getting into all these wild changes and it takes quite a while for anything to really settle down and become universal. Okay. Um, that's the simplest explanation. And actually, before we go to the next question, I forgot on the one before this, um, he did ask about windage as well. Oh yeah. Most guns were not adjustable for windage. Um, so you just figured it out. It's kind of in three. Most of them weren't adjustable in that war. Um, the ones that were, a lot of them might have been more like the Norwegians where they had an adjustable windage sight, but you had to have a special screw head to do that mm -hmm. because you would adjust it more for aligning that gun than for the actual windage. Right. And then you have stuff like uh, the U.S. and Britain, like the original short magazine Lee Enfields before the Mark III star improvement. Mm -hmm. They tended to have windage. Because uh, the U.S. and Britain had competition-style shooters, um, like a very strong culture of competition shooting. Same with Norway, actually, which is probably why they had the same options. Um, and then, like, Switzerland, we saw. Um, they had driftable front sights and things. Yeah. Um, Those were neat, too. Yeah, the competition-style countries were much more about the adjustment. In terms of adjustment on the fly, you really see it with the U.S. and Britain going into, like, the Buffington sites are just, that's a computer, you know? Mm -hmm. The problem is once you get there, it turns out what you really want your rear sight to do is just take a very strong hit because it's going to get banged around more than it's going to be shot. Right. And then uh, when you're shooting, Kentucky windage works pretty well in a fight. Sitting there and dialing in a fight almost never really happened unless you were sniping. Mm -hmm. So, and even if you're doing that, you kind of have the time to take a read of the windage and just go with it. Right. Um, so windage was not as big a deal. Sorry, okay. I just want to make sure I didn't miss that. Yeah, no, definitely. I get that. Oh, I get to turn a page. Mm -hmm. Page three. <laughs> All right, so next question. Uh, who actually thought the barley corn site was a good idea? Does it have any advantages over Nosh and Post style of tangent sites? Right. Uh, you don't, they don't break. Yeah, they're very rigid. Yeah, they're just a big lump of triangular metal. And you see when they try to get away from the barley corn, you start having to put front sight protectors on everything. Yeah. So I think it's just one of those evolutions where it's just like, well, we don't want the sight getting damaged. And also, you're coming out of the black powder era in which you don't have the same range or fineness of precision. Mm -hmm. So you really are just trying to get people pointed in the right direction and volley firing at first, which is why the barley corn would have been normal for quite a while. And then once you get into precision shooting, it's like, this thing's hard to read. And then you see some weird things like the French go the other way. They make it really big and blocky with a little notch in it. Oh, yeah. And that's like 
And it's shallow, too, right. on top of that. And then, so, so, like, this U.S. Springfield 1903 blade, mm-hmm. like, fine blade. So Very easy to shoot at long distance. Right, but then that becomes vulnerable to damage. Right. So... Mm, There's trade-offs. Right. All right, let's see here. Um, what are your thoughts on sites, specifically the distances they are marked for on the World War One era rifles? It seems they were rather optimistic for what some of the cartridges were capable of. Yes, but again, Plevna. Mm-hmm. And then also for the British, you have the Second Boer War. Yep. Um, those are two instances in which range was critical. Mm-hmm. Accurate fire at long range was very critical. And that was typically like the battles they were used to, everyone was used to, was these long range Not um, necessarily. Distance. No. There, you could get really? closer battles, but the thing is, if you get in close, and you are, if everybody's using long infantry rifles with these fixed iron sights, right, it doesn't hurt you any to, to leave them at 100, well, 300 meters usually on average. Mm-hmm. But you leave them at their low setting. And then you just fight with them that way. But on the rare occasion that you get caught in open terrain or you get dragged into a battle on open terrain that you weren't expecting, Mm -hmm. because you don't want to be on open terrain. No. But if you are, might as well put some stuff on there. So you you get them sighted way out to 2,000 meters. You get them or higher. And then on top of that, beyond that range, especially probably because of Plevna, Mm -hmm. you get volley sights because it's like, well... Mm, if we've got the ammo and we really want to disrupt what they're doing, we'll just lob shots at them from over the friggin' horizon. Right. Um, like light artillery. Mm-hmm. And why not? I mean, if you don't use it, you don't use it. That's fine. It's not going to hurt you to carry around, you know, several ounces of extra weight. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, and not, th- not that will potentially that prevent them from advancing. I mean, really so. not even several ounces. You're talking about like fractions of an ounce to get these sort of features on there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, why not throw it on there? Um, the trick is it just wasn't all that useful in World War One, unless you were in the Alps, and then you're trying to shoot from canyon to canyon, or from mountain uh, to mountain. peak to peak, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll take all 2,000 meters, thank you. Oh yeah, please well, and thank you. It's, it's going to be good. Yeah. All right, let's see here, next one. Uh, which rifle or MG cartridge struck the best balance in World War One? What's your call? I mean, I actually prefer something closer to like... Well, I guess World War One, so I can't say like seven seven jab, which would be nice. No, but well, that'd be a seven seven. Uh, the seven seven Japanese cartridge is um, very close to three oh three. Yeah. Ballistically, but then it's not rimmed. Rim, yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of performance, I actually, and again, I don't get deep into the details, and it's going to be highly dependent on your bullet and your actual powder and blah blah blah. blah, mm-hmm. blah. But just in terms of preference, uh, I love guns chambered in seven millimeter Mauser. Well. That's pretty easy one, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, seven millimeter Mauser is probably my preferred compromise cartridge. It's smaller, flatter, and then I know a lot of you are going to start screaming six point five, and you're right, six point five is dang good. But mm-hmm. in World War One, it was almost all bottle nosed. Yeah, that's actually what I was thinking was six point five, like the sweet or something like that. But then bottle nosed. Right, and by the time you get it to a Spitzer, you're yes, a Spitzer six point five is better than a bottle nose six point five if done correctly. Yes. The gain going from bottlenose to Spitzer is not as much as the gain is going from a bottlenose 8mm to a, a Spitzer 8mm. Mm. And I think 7mm kind of, and this is more intuition than practical. I haven't sat down and done a ballistics test. 7mm is a very good long-range Spitzer cartridge, flat shooting, that has good um, performance on target mm-hmm. in terms of lethality. That also does not beat the crap out of you. True. That also can run out of short rifles. It's not great for carbines because it's a little throaty for it's a little boomy for carbines. Yeah, a little bit. But short rifles, it runs very well out of. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just tend to like that cartridge. Fair. Fair a lot. What do you think? Six point five fifty five Swede. I mean, to be fair, I do like it. I thought it was a good cartridge. It had just enough stopping power, I thought, and recoil wasn't always terrible with them. Yeah. They're actually pretty stand, pretty mild. Okay. But I'm probably losing the battle here between the two of us. I don't know. I don't think, I think it's good. The problem is it wasn't really in the war, but right. it's good. Um, I mean, I think people don't give enough credit to some of the 6.5 cartridges. Mm-hmm. They're certainly capable. I don't. They get talked down all the time, but I think they're a very capable cartridge and certainly not as wasteful of material and range and blah as trying to run around with, you know, 8 millimeter Mauser and 8 millimeter LaBelle. Ugh, you know, so. God, yeah, no LaBelle. Yeah. Thank you. I'm good. All right, what do we got next? Oh, uh, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 there we go. If the Second Boer War had not happened, oh, we're into the what ifs, uh, what would you do, wait, what would do you, 
That's good fine. grammar. It's like, don't, don't be mean. <laughs> Do you think the British Army's rifle would have been in 1914? Would the SMLE, when the smelly have happened, would the British so, Army have been better equipped, trained for the war they had never planned for? I don't know. Um, the, it's hard to call. I think without the Second Boer War, the, the British would have been more complacent. So my intuition is that they would have looked more like Germany going into World War Two. Yeah. Or World War One, yeah. where Germany had the Gewehr 98 as standard, mm-hmm. but they had a fair number of Car 98 AZs. And then as the war went on, they are like, we need more of these Car 98 AZs. These are better, right? Mm-hmm. If there was no other catalyst to drive the British to change, I suspect we would have seen long lees with minor improvements over the previous models. Because the British did have a habit of constantly improving their rifles. I just think... You might not have gotten that complete fork into short magazine Lee Enfield. What you probably would have had is, um, I don't. They may. They Do you still think they may have, have had a desperation need for maybe some Rosses? I think they would have developed. I think we would have been in the same territory as the Carnegie Z and the Norwegian nineteen twelve. I think they would have developed a short magazine Lee Enfield anyway. Mm-hmm. I think they would have gone for a quote unquote universal short rifle, but they probably would have only given it to everybody that was an infantry. Fair. But I could be wrong because the U.S. didn't have that catalyst. Like we had the, the Spanish-American War, and one of the things that we took out of it wasn't just to get into a Mauser pattern rifle. And there were early, you know, there's early versions of the Springfield 1903, not even in 19, there were early test prototypes that were full-length guns. And then the U.S. went, yeah, ballistically we do fine with a short rifle. I don't know why we're doing all this. So Britain could have came to the same conclusion without the Boer War, especially working with the U.S. as well as they did and sort of bouncing off each other. I highly suspect that they would have still ended up with a universal short rifle. Mm -hmm. I just don't know. I don't know that they would have done it as fast. Mm -hmm. And I think it would have been much more like the Car 98 or the the Norwegian 12 where they're like, yeah, we really want this to be universal, but we've got all these infantry rifles and we've already put a lot of momentum behind that because it would have dragged that decision on into 1905, 1906, 1907. Right. So uh, that's my intuition, but I can't say for sure because what if. Yeah. Um, give me one second to cool the cameras, and I think somebody knocked at the door. Okay. All right, next question. Um, in your research, have you come across records of unit volley fire employed in an indirect fire fashion? I've seen mention of it very, 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 very early in the war. So how early are we talking here? Like, before the race to the sea kind of stuff, you okay. know? Okay. Um, I don't know that it ever worked. <laughs> That's... Uh, I don't, I think once, once they realized what they were in for, they stopped wasting that ammo. Um, cause it really was only a disruption tactic and machine guns could do it a lot better. So really once the machine guns started rolling, there was, there was no reason for volley fire. The machine gun would do your volley fire for you, Okay. which stayed around. Machine guns would run volley fire. Oh yeah. So it's weird. We make fun of the volley sites, but they're not an insane proposition. You get a mass of people formed up on a square mm-hmm. and you get them sighted for the same range, picked on the same target. And if you're correct about your estimation, it's just so much harder to get all those guys lined up than it is to just take a machine gun, dial it in like a computer. And right. Like and then just let there. it go. Right. It was way less of a science. You know, officers would be trained on it to some degree, but I don't think it was nearly the science it was. Fair. So. Okay. Uh, let's see here. If Australia was to do a Canada and adopt a rifle in 303 that wasn't Lee and Field, assuming domestic production at Lithgow, uh, what would have been the best to adopt? Just a Mauser derived action or something different? Um, Are we even we haven't really gotten too much into Australia, have we? I don't know of any prototype Australian domestic rifles. Yeah. So I can't name any that they would have just made like the Ross because that's the Canada thing. The Canada thing was like. We're going to go with this wild thing done by Ross, which is really just a weird copy of the Austrian Monlicker mm-hmm. turned to 11, you know? So, like, theoretically, Australia could have adopted just about anything that would chamber 303. It just would have probably depended on who influenced them. And what they're able to produce if right. they were really determined to produce it themselves. But I'm going to tell you, there's only two avenues that I could really consider that they would take. That would be sensible. Okay. But the Canadians were not exactly sensible, so... Yes. The problem is Canada got going because it's a guy set up a commercial factory and then sold to the government. So you'd almost need to have what whoever set up a commercial factory for a relatively decent gun would be the one Australia would try to buy from. Mm-hmm. But if they're trying to produce it at Lithgow, well, then they're going to have a totally different set of pattern behavior. And so what they'll probably do is they'll probably look to simplify and correct problems with the short magazine Lee Enfield. 
You can see that happen in World War II with the number four series of guns where they bulk up the receiver, make it easier to mill. Mm -hmm. They bulk up the barrel to get rid of some of that. Because um, remember, the, the, the short magazine, the Enfield Mark III's and stuff, they suffer from that pencil barrel problem. They even have a dampener. You know what I mean? Right. Because there's some – they don't have – Stepped barrels, they don't have whatever. So then to solve that issue, which people will argue isn't an issue, but then if it wasn't an issue, why did they introduce a new gun in the middle of World War II? They bulked up the barrel and squared up the receiver and did some other things to clean up some of the problems they had with the Enfield. So Australia probably could have started doing that fairly early because they were known problems. So they mm -hmm. could have done essentially an early number four. All the technology for it existed. So you could have done the number four way earlier. No reason not to. Mm -hmm. You know, Nothing prevents them from doing it. Or um, they could have done um, the P-14 because the designs were already there from Britain. It was already set up for 303. It was, like you said, the, he was asking would they have done another Mauser drive action. The P-14 really was supposed to be the gun, the number one, the next British service gun, which I think was a good gun. Mm -hmm. But also it was the one that's easier to make. It's actually easier to make the P-14 than it is to make the short magazine Lee Enfield. It's True. just that by that time, Lithgow had already gone through all the steps of getting ready to make a short magazine. It was, it was absolute hell to get ready to make that gun. Like every time I read accounts of another factory trying to make short magazine Lee Enfields, they're like, Jesus, this is so much harder to make than other guns. Um, I'm not really sure why in the mechanical aspect, but it just it had a lot to do with tuning into getting into pattern, and the guns are a little more feely than other guns. Hmm. The P-14s are far easier to produce, apparently. The U.S. was able to do it with some Mass interchangeability production. problems, sure. but each of the guns worked. It's just that they're making them interchange with each other was difficult. Fair. But um, you also have fewer number of parts that are all trying to get all the parts to interchange on a Lee Enfield versus all the parts to interchange on a P-14. There's some tinkering there. Yeah. So I P14 or they could have alt history done a better short magazine Lee Enfield, which would be like the number four style. But that's really sure, all. It makes I, sense. Yeah. This would be like the two they might be able to go with. Yeah. Although if they did that, I don't think you would have gotten the bayonet mounted to the barrel because it was very in vogue to not have the bayonet mount on the barrel. It was, that's why the short magazine Lee Enfield looks the way it does. That's why the, again, the Norwegian 1912 looks the way it does. Trying, Super rad looking. Yeah, there. trying to get that bayonet lug off the barrel. Mm -hmm. So, what else? Okay, let's see here. Mm, out of all the different models of crags that ever did crag, which was the craggiest of crags? What was your favorite crag? You already declared king of crag. The 1912? Yeah. Yeah, did it's you, pretty rad. Yeah, I declare 1912 king of crag. It's pretty rad. <laughs> there's other cool crags. Well, like, it, it's a pretty cool crag. I mean, there's some crags we didn't even talk, I think, technically on the episode. That... We've never handled the U.S. cavalry carvings. Right. That'd well, be I mean, kind of cool. Specifically cavalry. But we've never, heard, we've never handled the U.S. crag carvings. Mm -hmm. But you can't convince me. I know I'm jaded now, but you can't convince me that they're better than the Norwegian. The Norwegian has better locking surfaces. The cartridge is really sweet. Mm -hmm. The Norwegian 1912 is the strongest receivered and barreled one. So it's also the, the more accurate one compared to even the long rifle. Mm -hmm. It's the winner. It's the yeah, best. It's the king of crags. I mean, it it's way the so much more than you think. Oh, yeah. Like you're looking at it you're like, clearly this is going to be like, no. It's the same weight as the long <laughs> rifle. It's crazy. But, they yeah, just added it all back. Norwegian 1912 is king of crag. Yeah, it's still the craggiest of crags. Unless, I mean, I guess there's some target ones out there that have like cool diopter sights and stuff, but we never handled them. That'd be neat to try. They're not, but... They weren't military issue anyway. I mean military issue so that they could go into competition but mm -hmm. not issue yeah. so okay let's see there we go uh hypothetically if the u.s had ordered the crag another crag question back in 1896 with two locking lugs stripper clip loading like the parkers devised and um semi-pistol grip tangent rear sight full length guard etc would the u.s have ever created the 1903 springfield rifle and continued to have refined the crag before well continue yeah. So if the U.S. had the better crag, would we have done the 1903? Basically, yes. Probably. I yeah. <laughs> so I think if we had had a stripper clip loading dual locking lug crag, when we go into Spanish-American War and we come up against the Mauser 1893, instead of being like, oh, God, they have a superior rifle to us mm -hmm. across the board, we... It's really hard. It's really hard to gauge this one. The U.S., let me put it into context. The U.S. won the Spanish-American War handily, right? Mm -hmm. Won it fine. Then turned around and went, man, their gun is way better than ours. We need to fix this crap. That's remarkable. 
to win the war and still be like, we need to do and better. And like critique your own shit. Or that's amazing. Yes. And I suspect some of what they ran into is that in the Spanish American war, we still had a lot of people using trapdoors mm -hmm. because crags were expensive and difficult to produce. And I think a lot of what happened is when they encountered that Mauser, they're like, this is so many fewer machine operations. Mm hmm. I mean, so much easier to make. They just the were like, "This is a, such a better opportunity." And clearly superior in strength mm -hmm. and loading and bleh, uh, across the board superior in every way, cost, you know, reliability. So the problem is, if we had had a superior crag, then the only thing would be like these Mausers look a lot easier to make. Yeah, and they look like they're going to be faster to pop out. Right. They also have rimless ammunition that performs pretty well. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. would have then had to either make a Spitzer Crag, which with the tool front locking lugs it could have done. Like there could have been a world in which you ended up with a rimmed Spitzer Crag, just like Mark 7 British ammo. Like that's that's completely a world that could exist. However, I still think we ultimately would have come around to short rifle concepts, but mm -hmm. maybe not. I don't know. Because it's in the development of Springfield 1903 that we really start looking at the short barrel stuff. Mm -hmm. So again, the U.S. could have, it's the same question all over again with the British one. The U.S. could have ended up with long and short crags right at the start of World War I, or maybe they would have finally gotten around to being like, eh, we want rimless ammo. Do you think they would have come up with a speed loader, like the speed, the, the loading clips for the crags sooner too, potentially? Because those well, came out after the Well, the Parkhurst war. device is him saying that if they had had a speed loader. Mm -hmm. So that came after, yes, but if they had had it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It gets really tricky. I don't think there's an easy answer here because it's probable that we would have stuck with the crag a lot longer um, just on the basis that the manufacturing for it was already set up. Mm -hmm. But we were still pretty unhappy with the crag, but we were unhappy with it for lots of reasons. So, you know, we might have been comfortable enough. And, and the interesting thing is the one thing that would might push us to a rimless cartridge earlier would have been machine gun technology. But then if you look at the machine guns the U.S. used, they would all have been compatible with rimmed ammunition anyway. Because it was like Maxim and then the um, uh, Benny Merci. Mm -hmm. And both of those are perfectly compatible with rim cartridges. Sure. I mean, to the point that it's it's a non-factor. So, yeah, we could if it hadn't been for how terrible it's the possible. crag was, you might not have had the 1903. Yeah. And then also you could have still done... It's the P14 thing where we started making 1917s. Mm -hmm. It was set up for rim 303 cartridges. You could have done a 3040 P14 1917. That'd have been neat. Okay. Uh, what do we got next? All right. Let's see. Uh, thank you for the pause. What gun um, that you have covered most fits? My brain says no, but my heart says yes. Oh, we're in a territory where you can start giving some opinions. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind of you. No, to be fair, the problem is we're getting a lot of questions about uh, historical technicalities, and I put them at the front because that's when my mind is going to be sharpest. Yeah. And so it's just, it's a lot of me fielding those questions, and then we're going to get more and more into the show, which you can answer, because May does a lot of running the show. I just don't then, typically do a lot of the research side of things. No, that's my job. Yeah. Like, you chase around, like, the editing, and you chase around the dates, and you chase around the other people. Were, if you're working with us, you're talking to May more than me, you know? It's <laughs> true. Like, the problem is May is much more organized than I am, because I have to, like, get down in this just place and find... Desk. Yeah. No. Or your car. <laughs> my car is fine. It's fine. Do you want me to get the camera out and we'll go no, look in your car? No, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. We all, uh, I will look in my, you can no. look in my car. My I car also clean your like car. One you bottle left stuff of water there. You, in there. Half the stuff in my car is your stuff. You just left it in there. Yes. Yeah, take it out of your car. Tell no, me to come help it you. It lives there. Like a hoarder. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, brain says no, but heart says yes. Um, the biggest one that's, we've said it before, is the Dryza in that completely um, doesn't seem like it would be one that worked and then everyone was able to shoot it and shoot it well from the get-go. 32 ACP, yet we're all sitting there feeling fantastic after shooting it and handling it because we were just able to, all of us, drill a hole with it. Right. That's remarkable. And no, then, definitely the drives is weird. Mm -hmm. the, the, although that one's even weirder because that's like your brain and heart are like, what the hell is going on like, here? Like, you don't even know why and it's then, happening, and, and it's your, happening. your performance is through the roof, and you're like, why does this work? <laughs> you're like, this isn't me. This is the gun. What? <sighs> that was crazy. 
I think mine is probably like the Webley self-loader pistol. Just because your wait, so your brain says no, but your heart says yes. Yeah, because it's like, what is this rectangle? And it only has however, like seven round capacity or whatever it is. I can't remember now. Six, I think. Uh, six or seven. Anyway, it's like single stack, giant cartridge, totally unnecessary. Like, it's so big for what it does, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's, it's frankly awful in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And then you pick it up and you're like, huh, rectangle gun. Boom, boom. <laughs> like, it's just fun. I uh, just love how... Having one around, you know what I mean? The just, Webley Fosbury? No, no, the, the Webley self loader. Oh, I thought you said Fosbury. I no, was no, like, I think I said self loader. Okay, I hope you did because no, I thought you Fos- said Fosbury. Actually, the Fosbury is the one that I thought like would be an answer to this. Brain says no, heart says yes. Mm-hmm. I'm just not that invested in the Fosbury. Yeah, my I heart think, is not quite that there with it. Maybe it's just like the 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 my poor up my well not poor upbringing but like my lower middle. Uh, yeah, like I have. I have the poverty mindset where you're like, mm-hmm. how much did that cost? And like, the f- <laughs> you're like, you, you know, probably self loaders now that, you know, what are they? They hover around 1500 maybe? No, probably lower than I that. I don't know, actually. In the collector's market, they're like a not $2,000 gun, though. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They're like a sub $2,000 gun for Mark and Naval, right? Okay. So, really weird gun, expensive, but mm-hmm. really weird, okay? And rare. Then you get the Webley Fosbury, which is also. Really weird and rare, but then they're like eighteen thousand dollars, and I'm just like, no, <laughs> like I just can't. Something about that breaks me. I just see that number, and I'm like, mm. Mm. I mean, my brain likes the idea of it. On paper, it sounds. I like cool. the idea of having eighteen thousand dollars. Yeah, I like that idea like better. The idea of giving That's that where away. my heart says. I've yes. never spent anything like that. No. And we, yeah, we've, yeah, no, Mm-mm. no. This is why I'm not a machine gun collector either. You know. God, no, I, yeah. I really love machine guns a lot. Yeah. And not even because blah, 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 that's what everybody's into. Mm-hmm. What I like is the, the mechanism. The mechanisms, yeah. Yeah, just that. It's, it's such a Rube what? Goldberg thing. Yeah. And if I was like Bill Gates, I would have a machine gun collection. And yes, I would fire my machine gun collection, but that's not really why I would want it. I would want to fire them in order to see them do the thing. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are like, would you get, like, the dopest slow-motion camera? Oh, yeah, no, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. I'd be, like, no, I'd be going weirder than that. I'd be, like, getting acrylic receivers made that would oh, last. Oh, that would be right. They would last all of, like, oh, not even 100 rounds. You know, it's, like, right. something that would hold together just for 50 rounds, but we could film it, you mm-hmm. know, and, and just try to, light, like, load the lightest powder we can so that it doesn't just immediately fill with smoke. Right. But see if we can't get, like, three rounds just in a clear box. That would be me. By the way... Donate to Patreon because if I become a millionaire, I'm <laughs> doing that. Acrylic like, machine guns. Yeah, well, <laughs> so the the advantage to supporting CNR so while we're talking about currency is that I want to do this. Yeah. So, and you'll make sure it's done correctly. Yeah, it's kind of like having a video series about cocaine being hosted by someone who's addicted to cocaine. Like, I'm going to be like, look at these guns. I love, I love them. And I'm going to That's like, exactly what he does whenever they come in. He instantly just rubs them under his nose. I'm actually pretty obsessed with finding ways to better explain and explore these guns so that people understand what they're seeing. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, you went so far as to start everything with just even 2D animations to try to help un- explain the complicated mechanisms. Yeah, I really like talking about how they work. I really like talking about, I like showing people because the problem is not everybody can own this stuff. No. Most people can't own even a, a, a quarter of what we're gonna see. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It's, they, it's expensive. And there's a finite number of guns. And if we all wanted to own them all at the same time, it's gonna be a mess. Right. But we can record them. Mm-hmm. We can explore them. Mm-hmm. We can we can take something about that experience with that firearm and, and take it out of how, how we feel and try to put it into you. And that's what I'm trying to do. And everybody talks about how great the show is. And I hate it. Because <laughs> it's not all you want to do. I'm, you I'm want so, to do so much more. I am so imperfect at showing you guys this stuff. And after every episode, I'm like, why didn't I say it this way? Why didn't I show it this way? And as a matter of fact, May and I have been talking about... I'm always talking about trying to do more shorts and things. Mm-hmm. But then I never have the time. Which is why I, I'm obsessed with growing the show 
only because I want the time to turn around and start doing little segments of like, hey, in case you missed it, this is what I was saying. Let me say so it So like some stuff you haven't been able to go to as far in depth or like, remember in this episode when I was like, I will talk about more about this another time. This is the time. <laughs> also it exposes it to more people. Yes. Just like the, just the little details. Remember when we were talking about like the variety, the ability to walk the site up by clicking either side. Yeah, that's super rad. I, I never would have noticed that. There's a kinesthetic thing to that that I'm yeah. obsessed with. I'm sorry, we got way down the rabbit hole. Oh, we totally did. But You're I, welcome. I want to convey that. I have, right now I have an accessory being made by a friend who does leather mm -hmm. because I found a weird device, has nothing to do with World War One, but it's a vintage device. Oh, yeah. I found it. I tried researching it, I couldn't figure it out why it had some features. And I'm trying to surprise you guys with this. Um, until I was like, I found one reference to it in a 1930s book. I couldn't get it online. So then I had to go through this whole months long process of finding this book. I got the book in, I got it open. I finally figured out not only how it's supposed to work, but there was actually a drawing. Mm -hmm. And it was not a very good drawing, but it was enough to figure it out. So now the reason why the, this accessory didn't make any sense is because there's another accessory made out of leather that goes with it. Mm -hmm. So I'm having somebody make one so that I can put them together, and then I'm gonna do like a five minute video in which I blow everybody's mind about this device from the 30s. And they're all gonna be like, I want that now. And so I is this gonna be like a year from now? No, well, it's whenever I get the leather thing. This would okay. be an easy one to film. But it's just one of those little side projects that I've had going for a year now, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Trying to figure it out. And then eventually I'm gonna put out a five minute video and everybody's gonna be like, that's, a, it's like the Alofs. It took me forever to find one. Oh, yeah. And then I put out a video, millions of views because people are like, oh wow, that's really it's wild. It's a really rad, weird contraption. Yeah, and so like, I really love doing those little things, but then I also have to do all the actual work work. So right. like, anyway, so support the show and I'll, I mean, if we had, oh my God, if we could triple our budget, mm -hmm. I could hire another researcher. Oh God, you would love that. Help, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know, anyway, so. I forgot where we're at. Uh, okay. I get to turn a page. That's where we're at. Oh, boy. Let's see. Page four. Four out 15. of 15. Okay. Yeah. We're doing good. We got this. It's okay. only been like an hour. Um, if you could get your hands on a heck of a beater Ross rifle, would you ever consider attempting the short Ross rifle as described at the end of our episode that we did on it? Yeah. If it had barrel damage, there's a guy in Canada that's making stocks. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure we could Is get- Is he your friend? Well, so it would have been modified from an original, right? And he's making reproduction fittings and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't even have to necessarily ruin an original stock. I could probably order one of those okay. and then cut that down, you know? Mm -hmm. Or if there's already a cut down supporter, I just don't want to ruin a good Ross rifle. It's just for some little exploration of whatever. It's not worth ruining a, a good one. Right. But, you know, um, I believe I know someone that actually has what looks like a good Ross rifle, but the bore is bulged. Didn't have a Ross that had a barrel that was shorter? No, it wasn't shorter. We knew some... Oh, that was a Mark II that you're thinking of. Oh, but okay. we knew somebody that had a, a, a 1910, but they had a bulge, like, uh, most of the way down the barrel that had completely ruined its ability to shoot. Mm. So that one's tricky because it's like the gun looks correct, but it'll never shoot straight again. Right. Do you cut that one? You it's know? a hard call You don't many. cut its wood. No. But then... The wood then, on it was, yeah. So right. that's when I'm like, uh, no, nah, probably not. But if the uh, pre sporterized, because a lot of them have been cut down. True. The problem is when you find them sporterized, <laughs> my life. you find them sporterized, then one of the first things they do is they sh sh mill off the back, mm -hmm. which gets us nothing because we need that whole rear sight assembly. Right. But in theory, we could get one that was milled off and go get a receiver off of another one. And True. But then you're going through. But then how many of those are you going through? Right. How many how many sporterized Ross rifles does it take to make this guy? If anybody has, I'll have to get the barrel length. But if anybody finds a highly damaged or sporterized Ross rifle in a Mark III configuration, not the Mark IIs, that's not what this was, mm -hmm. we're happy to try to take it on. Sure. Sounds like a plan. All right. Let's see. What do we got next? Um... Do you find it funny and odd that the most hated military rifle from the 20th century is now leading the way in bolt design for modern high-value bolt-action rifles? This is, this is one that started with a paragraph in front of it. I remember this question. Yeah. Why is the Mauser falling out of favor, basically? And he's in referencing uh, the Kukarno here, basically. And he's not wrong. So the gentleman was making the point that we don't see most um, bolt-action sporting rifles that you see nowadays are much more like the Carcano than they are like the Mauser. Just mm -hmm. a set of front-locking lugs, unibodied, um, whatever safety system built into the back, but very basic guns. 
you don't see all these extra things that are on a Mauser on sporting rifles anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's very expensive to do all those milling operations. Mm -hmm. And we've said this before, the Carcano is probably the, in, I don't know if it was actually the cheapest because it depends on how much energy Italy put into making it. But in terms of materials and cuts, it's got to be among the cheapest rifles of that war. Oh, yeah. Just in how simple of a design it is. It's simple yet rugged. They which is, performed well. Which is why its general shape has shown back up, because when you're cutting metal and you want to do it minimally, you end up with something that looks a lot like a Carcano. Not mm -hmm. the same magazine, not the same whatever, but, you know, tube, front lug and lugs, unibody, bolt body, central firing pin, you know, mm -hmm. it's very similar. Um, I think it's telling. Like, I think it's very telling that... Really, the sin of the Carcano is the fit. It's it's the final fitting and the lack of bolt support when you have it all the way out of the gun. Mm -hmm. But if you had a lot of modern hunting rifles, man, they don't have a fully supported bolt that's balanced out the back of the gun either. They kind of rattle. Yeah. So it's all fit and finish. That's what people really don't like about the Carcano because it's, it's, a, it's a something that comes through its trust and it's expressed as quality. It has nothing to do with its accuracy or reliability or anything. And in many cases, it helps its reliability. Mm -hmm. But it... it that lack of feel, that lightness, that wobbliness, that mm -hmm. rattliness, it all comes across as distrust in the system. Yeah. It is going to make you question its reliability. Yeah. To be fair, Carcano is extremely similar to, and for very good reason, the Monlicker Schoenauers. Except yeah. for the magazine, right? I say Schoenauers because it's the Gewehr 88 style of bolt, right? But you take something like... Derive from, yeah. You think Gewehr 88... Carcano goes over here, Monlicker Schoenauer goes over here in terms of quality. Mm -hmm. I love the Monlicker Schoenauer. Oh, yeah. It's smooth, it's supported, it feels, and it's materially, there's very little difference except for fit and finish. Yeah, it's polished. Yeah. So, oh, yay, Carcano. Yeah. All right, let's see what we got next. Um, since M Block is the French name, what did Monlicker call it? Uh, do you remember? Yeah, packet. Yeah. We looked it up. It, we have some of his drawings. Mm -hmm. um, the we, I was, I guess you gave me a gift of a book years ago before the show. Oh God, yeah, I guess you that was Sue's. like five years ago. Yeah, it was um, German language reprints of Monlicker's patents and his writing. It's all written in like you know black type German mm -hmm. language, but um, no, it's it's I, I believe that's his handwriting at that point. But is it? it? Um, no, that well, looks way the, too It's uniform. in the patent style, mm -hmm. but I don't know if he wrote his own patents or not. Mm. But it's it's the original Monlicker patent drawings, and they say packet. Mm -hmm. It's a packet. So, yeah, I guess that's it. Okay. All right, let's see. In World War I, when you captured enemy machine guns, you used it. Um, what happened to that gun after the combat was over, basically? So the idea is people would grab the gun and use it in combat. Right. I don't think that happened as much as you would think. Um, running machine gun is a complicated process and people had to be trained on it. I don't doubt that people would grab them and spin them around and try to put them to use. Mm -hmm. I don't think they would last very long without being handled by the right people. They're not as grab and go as you think they are. No. Um, generally, the, there was a bounty paid for those. So what you would do is you and your buddies would really try to hold on to it because you get paid. Most armies would offer pay for captured equipment and then that would be fed to the rear where it could be inspected and then put into a unit that had that uh, ammunition availability. Mm -hmm. And so they would be refielded usually to second line or reserves, but... So that's during combat. What about when combat was over? Well, no. So during combat, he's saying that like you might grab it and use it, which maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. Mm. But then after that, it would be, you take it back, you oh, probably okay. get paid a bounty for it. Yeah. I don't know about beginning of war, but definitely late. Mm -hmm. um, and then generally... The number one thing I think I see a lot of them getting used for is like anti-aircraft and stuff like that because you yeah, can put sure. them at the rear and just load them with whatever. And just let them run. Yeah. And then another pause. Sounds good. Next question. Uh, seeing a lot of attention paid to the FG-42, not only from the reproductions, but in general, this person can't help but wonder why no one has picked up production of them after World War II. Um, nobody was set up to produce them. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to... It's a whole retooling process. You could capture the entire factory and the workers and just keep it going. But <laughs> it's the, like you live here now. The country that had it wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the infrastructure for it wasn't there anymore. So what you would do is if you're someone else, you would take the lessons from it and apply it to what you were already working on. But if you're Russia, you've already got 
other stuff in the works. Mm -hmm. You're not really interested in, in small arms technology as much as you're interested in all sorts of missile technology and other stuff. True. Um, if you're in the U.S., again, you already have all this other stuff laying around and you get sort of – you start – you take lessons from it, you know, but you want to make it U.S.ified. And right. so – it was very influential in a lot of ways in terms of look what we could possibly do. Mm -hmm. But the actual execution of it didn't really fit in with anybody else's current plans of what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of post-war development really does carry on with what was being – what was already on the way. Mm -hmm. It's just like you don't see immediate uh, responses to the um, Sturmgewehr. You oh, kinda, yeah. You kind of do with Russia doing their own intermediate cartridge and stuff. They're the, probably the most that sort of – at least take those influences over. And a lot of people say, oh, the accused a copy of, no, but it, it's in that same vein of thought, you know? Mm -hmm. um, the problem is the vein of thought of sort of a light automatic infantry rifle that does all this stuff. You really start to see that move towards like the G3 and FAL, you know, battle rifles. Not, yeah, FAL's I know good. that doesn't quite answer all those same things. If, if FG's a little different, but you tend to see uh, light infantry automatics. Mm-hmm. Um, as being the lesson that comes away from that, and they look for different ways to execute that. Okay. So, yeah. All right, let's see. Oh, we're into some shotgun territory here, I see. Made it a whole clone category, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Which shotgun are you most looking forward to covering in this series? You. Me personally? Mm -hmm. Well. Uh-oh. You're on the spot? No, I'm trying to think of it, actually. I'm going through the ones in my head. Honestly, I love the Shorgan. That oh, one's pretty dope. Yeah, I think it's Hogren. Oh, yeah, it's Hogren. That's right. Hey, it was branded I, I, it's as... The, it's got an S starting, it, like... It was sold as the normal automatic. In yeah, so that one's pretty rad. The normal automatic. That's a pretty cool one. The goose gun will be fun. That's way down the line. I know, but that way, would be hilarious. That would be like end of series almost. Well, now I've just spoiled it. I've done the night... Oh, shoot, I just we're told not, him what the Night's of 11 is. We're under. only <laughs> prepping through, I think, 1918 or 1920. I think I, can't, I haven't quite decided, but we're only prepping up to 1920 before we launch. The Widowmaker will be fun. Yeah, the, the Widowmaker is a cool one. Yeah. Uh, personally, I. Oh god, I'm supposed to list only one. I'm like listing like three that yeah, I'm really looking forward to. <laughs> Sorry. Um. I mean, you could steal mine. I said the Widowmaker. I'm pretty excited for the Burgess. And not oh, just god, that is going to be rad. Not just because it folds. You know, there's the foldy boy. That's mm -hmm. cool. But I'm pretty excited about it because it is, to me, one of the most novel. It's got to be the most novel slide action shotgun. Well, one of two of the most novel slide action shotguns. I know which shotguns. other one, yeah. yeah you're thinking, thinking of a two shot, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but I think that's pretty rad too. I'm actually trying very hard. There's nobody that's really written about the Burgess shotguns. It's it's sort of a side mention in another Burgess book. Mm -hmm. um, there's sub models of the Burgess, which I didn't know going into this. And then the Burgess company markets the new model this and the new model that. And some of it's like after their bankruptcy and bought out. So it's like, wait, what? So who's who actually, doing this? Right. <laughs> like the dates don't really line up. There's some Did weird. the workers just not leave? They just kept going? <laughs> no, it was probably that the uh, IP was being liquidated. Mm -hmm. um, and the, so were the products. You know what I mean? So it's probably after the buyout, Winchester's like, well, let's just sell this let's crap Let's get rid of this. Crap. Yeah, extra cash, whatever. And so they kept saying the, the new model this and that. And I'm trying to figure out if there's any... There, there are fundamental differences between different Burgesses. Like, mm -hmm. features come and go. Um, the question is, can they be subdivided into models that line up with the marketing models? Or is it just that there's an ABC and that's... So I'm actually still trying to unpack the Burgess. We will not be doing episodes on it like we do for Primer, though. So I won't be sitting there trying to define all this to you at first. Mm -hmm. First flush on that series is going to be just a 10 minute video that shows you the gun and vaguely talks about, it. not vaguely, but talks about it to a degree appropriate for a Wikipedia article. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, it's not going to be a primer. And then the reason for that That's is, why it's not going to replace any primers. I think if I tried to do primer style for shotguns, it would be a magnificent failure because that pump has not been primed. I think the reason primer works is because most of you out there have heard of at least two-thirds of the guns we cover. Mm -hmm. If we start to do the shotgun series, you're going to quickly find that you haven't really heard of two-thirds of the guns. Mm -hmm. So you're only going to be familiar with one-third and vaguely. It's going to be too much data on something that you don't really care about. Some of you will love that, but the grand public will not and the views will be very low. So you're going to make them care is what you're saying. So we're going to do this series and then two, three years later it's going to be like, all right, would you like a big long episode on the Burgess? And everybody's going to be like, yes, because we've known about it forever. What's wrong with you? And it's like, yeah, okay, sure you did. <laughs> it's going to be like the ALOS all over again. Why haven't you told us about this? Yeah. 
Well, Ian got yelled at for not doing any loss. So yeah. I know. I'm reminding them because <laughs> I'm a jerk. All right, what do we got? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, bah, 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 bah. After dealing with so many American shotguns, which do you think drove more innovation in the American market? Ease of use or ease of repair? Neither. Cost. Yeah. Uh, I, um, That's what it's boiled down to in your research so far? Well, first of all, they didn't give a crap about repair. Mm -hmm. um, second, like, so wait, if the gun just broke, like... It, so don't get do? me wrong. The American gun industry used to try to take care of their customers and take care of repairs and stuff, but it was very, as far as I can tell, they would still try to charge you for it. It was very not what you think of as modern service, like after service. Mm -hmm. Modern after service really emerges after like the World War II. Like you see um, Sochito Honda really gets behind this idea of like making sure that the customer is taken care of the for the at least the first two years of their product use or whatever mm -hmm. you know because it, it's that idea of selling reliability um we would market on reliability on terms of the ruggedness of the gun but we didn't really have that aftercare service the way you think of it in the modern sense we still had it just not it's not quite the same flavor mm -hmm. um and then ease of use is like problem is like right from the start for repeating shotguns it's, it's a pump you know it works mm -hmm. the way it works there's some things in terms i think what really happens is uh, a combination of styling and price okay so you make the gun look as uh oh if you look at other when we do our series when we get to the winchester model um 12 mm -hmm. it, well it'd probably be start with the remington 10 i think so it's the remington 10 and then the winchester model 12 are two guns that ooze futuristic styling in that period. So visibly they're very appealing then. The they look like something otherworldly. Nowadays we think of them as nothing because all shotguns look like them. It's that thing, I forget what it's called, but when you define the mold, you end up looking uninteresting. But at that time, you know, Remington 10, Winchester Model 12 were like the first two to really be like this sleek, perfect thing. So they looked cool. They looked Not just different. cool, they looked they looked futuristic. Okay. Um, now we think of as old, mm -hmm. but they were space age looking before space age was really even a thing that was being discussed. You know, mm -hmm. they looked like science fiction before science fiction really looked like that. They're, they're beautiful guns. Um, so that styling, that simple styling, and then it became a budget market. Um, right up until World War One, it was like there would be some competition in terms of like rifles. They'd be like, this is the better one and this is nicer and blah, mm -hmm. blah. But then immediately after the war, especially with the economics, um, Europe never really liked repeaters for shotguns. No. They never really took off. So America was the only repeater market, and then in repeating shotgun market, it became, ours is cheapest. <laughs> the cheapest one. It's the best for the least. And that's that's what it became. So that's what the marketing... And it stayed that way till today. It's still, you, go, you can only get, I mean, not really, there's other stuff, there's high-end stuff coming back into the market, and it, or it's always been there because it's for like, High-end shooting, those tend to be double guns and things like that. Right. More recently, you're starting to get high-end autos that kind of rebirthed off of some of the, um, I think it was like the Breda brand that came over that brought inexpensive autos to the U.S. And then that sort of re rebirthed a fine auto market. And then you start seeing expansion of fine autos. Okay. But generally, a pump gun is not a fancy gun. You don't see fancy pump guns now unless it's like marketed as a military or defense fanciness. It's mm. not really like a high-end fanciness to be a pump gun. Yeah. I guess you don't really see a lot of those because, on Because, yeah, the repeating gun market especially just went into budget mode. And then a little bit like badass. Like, here's a little military, but mostly it's just like, which one's cheap and does, 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 does the, the thing? thing. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. All right, let's see here. Um, how much slash often were the use of shotguns for not just bird hunting and clay shooting, but hunting larger four-legged animals with larger shot sizes? Um, Reference in advertising, magazine articles, and the lore of the time when repeating center fire shotguns were in their very early years. It's kind of weird. Um, you see more, It's as we've been doing our scan series for the uh, $5 patrons, um, I see a lot more mention of buckshot in the European magazines. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the US, yeah, they kind of tacitly be like, you can hunt buck with it. But really when they market shotguns. Um, it's usually waterfowl, things like that. Definitely right? number one, waterfowl. Yeah. Number two, fowl. And then number three, rabbit. Like yep. rabbit, um, really small uh, game. Yeah, foxes, uh, right. whatever you can get pellets off of basically. They don't. <sighs> 
and I know or pelts, I know sorry. from reading like old hunter trader trappers and stuff, people were using buck and slug, mm-hmm. but uh, it wasn't really marketed that way. And I think the reason they did that was to not cannibalize their rifle market. Because really, yeah, because why would you sell somebody just a shotgun? Yeah, when, when they could, could go for the rifle for something that could really take something out. Right. right. Sure, makes but, sense. Well, not even that; they just sell two guns. Yeah. So it doesn't. I mean, it's it's there, but not nearly as much as you would think. Hmm. They really sold sport and bird. Yep. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, you have an old broken pump shotguns. <laughs> oh God. Uh, that need help, what do? Reach over there. Let's see, get a chair. This is exciting. This is a riveting <sighs> life. <sighs> okay, you ready? Because okay. I know who sent this. Yeah. Doc, I have your gun, uh-huh. and as soon as I have two hours to breathe clear, I will go ahead and get the parts swapped with the spare receiver I have and see if it starts feeding. I'm sorry it's taking me a little while. I still love you. Okay. So this was a friend that you... Oh, it's Doc. It's Doc. ...that asked you to swap parts for... Or you suggested swapping parts with him on something? He really loves these... Steve. Doc is a beloved... Oh, yeah, that Western field? Yeah, he's yeah, a beloved beautiful. family member of mine. And um, he wanted a 520, and I just so happened to have encountered... This one that's been reblued and then it had two barrels matched to it, one of which had already been sawed off. So mm-hmm. it needs to be recrowned and cleaned up. Um, it's in legal length already, so that's good. Mm-hmm. And then it has a long and short barrel, and it's all matching. It's just been reblued and it's, it's room for somebody to tinker. So I came across these. I grabbed them up because they were inexpensive. Well, it's this plus two barrels. It was inexpensive. I grabbed it. And then not six weeks later, Doc's going, oh, I really want a 520, they're really cool, blah, blah, blah. And then he had some family stuff going on, and I was just like, I love him to death. So I was like, mm, here you go. Which was the beginning of my curse, because then once he got a hold of them, he found out it wasn't feeding properly, so now i got to fix them. Oh, yeah. So, I love you, Doc. I'll get to it when I get sick. He took the time right, to do that. I put it right next to my tools, Doc. It's sitting right over there. Uh, someone asked, why do you love shotguns so? Um, because they're underappreciated. Um, I don't, I actually really love rifles. I've been thinking about this too, because I can only collect so many things, you know? Yeah. Um. Give me the Sharpie. And a lot of the stuff that's here is on loan anyway, but what do I want to collect, you know? And I've accrued a few rarities because of just paying attention. Mm-hmm. But then I need to liquidate. Like, I need to get stuff back out. I need to get down. To, I don't need to own everything. Right. I can touch everything and not own everything. And then the shotguns you specifically have been bringing in the house because you... We've been having to hold on to them for a few years now. And just somebody loaning us one out, that would be quite difficult for that long period of time. The way that... Mar- we did the pricing on the market. It's gone up a little bit because of the panic. We did the pricing on the market and we realized that it was far easier to buy them... Hold on to them for a couple of years while we get everything set up because we thought it was going to take two and now it's mm-hmm. just dragging on, which I'm glad we bought instead of borrowing. Right. I would have felt horrible borrowing this long. And then I, I love you guys. You loan me stuff. It's really cool. Even when you're the coolest loaning guy ever, we still have to figure out getting it back and forth, shipping and insurance, all this other stuff, at which point the costs get above the average cost of a beater shotgun at the gun show. Right. So... The easier thing is to buy up too many shotguns, get everything in chronological order, get them serviced. Working order, yes. Right. And then shoot them and then liquidate, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was sitting there going, wow, you know, it's funny, but if I do this, I will then have the most complete repeating shotgun collection in North America. I can't, no, I don't think anybody's got one as complete as I have right now, even with some of the, because I discovered two models while Mm -hmm. I was doing this. So... It's kind of weird because it's like a prestige point. For the for one time in my life, I kind of have a prestige point where I'm like, wait a second, I'm the biggest shotgun guy. It's true. But I don't really want to own like a million shotguns. <laughs> like, what do I do with them? It's a lot of money tied up in them. Like, I can't do this. So I had that brief moment of like, do I switch my collection? Because I gave my World War II collection to do the show. Mm-hmm. And then I started kind of tinkering with World War I stuff. And I was just like, I don't know. And I was only really a World War II rifle collector. Mm-hmm. So now it's like... I'm going to return to rifles. I think it's just going to be World War One era rifles. It's going to be what I care about most, just like Ian does his French gun thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but that means that I won't be the coolest shotgun guy. It's true, you won't. But at least some of you will have seen the episodes, and then the shotguns will return to the market if I sell them. So hey. maybe somebody will be happy. But I just can't own. I don't think I can. Are just... you going to get rid of that Burgess folder? No, nah, never. <laughs> 
No. That's like the one thing that I was just like, I'm going to spend money on this and I'm going to keep it because the folder is just too cool. That is pretty rad. Okay. All right, next question. Let's see. Uh, please rate the 6.5 millimeter cartridges first in shoulder arms and then for machine guns. That's not a question. That's just somebody asking you to do a video. <laughs> I mean, all of the 6.5 millimeter cartridges? Uh, he's a 6.5 Swedish Norwegian optional. What, That's... what year? I guess well, he says one. If he says optional, it must be World War One context. I'm guessing. We're, um, gonna, we're yeah. gonna run out of time, so give us quick. Give me one second. All right, what 6.5s were? They? Okay, so I assume he's limiting us to World War One. Yeah. Which is why he said Norwegian optional. Okay, so there is 6.5. Yeah, that, and then Japanese. Jap. Yeah, I was thinking Jap. Um, well, okay, so not sweet or Norwegian, they're optional. Um, uh, liquor Schoenauer. Yeah. Which is rimless Dutch, but Dutch wasn't in the war, but let's get into the neutral, sure, why Sure. Not? Uh, Vigero, which was technically in the war. Are uh, you going to sit down with all this low data, like, off screen and rank all this now? No, keep going, hold on. And then 6555, like he mentioned, mm -hmm. which was still pretty much the Union cartridge back then. Mm -hmm. Um... I gotta be forgetting one. Romanians, because they use Dutch. That's right. why I'm thinking of it, which is the same cartridge. So, and then, oh my god, am I missing one? I probably. Not Serbia. Not. Uh, it's like I think there was a six point eight French for the A five. That's what I was thinking, but maybe 6 not. Six point eight though. Is no, I don't know. I don't anyway. remember. Okay, so. Uh, not Portuguese. Uh. Yeah, the Port the Vigero. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, they're all the same. Not really, but... Pretty dang close. The problem is post-war, well post-war, 6555 Swede emerges as probably the superior 6.5 cartridge because they spitzer it and they do other improvements, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then some of the other... I don't know if any of the others even got spitzered. Nori, Nori Spitzer theirs sooner than the Swedish, but not to the same potency. Yeah. Um, because of the limitations Jacks of the crack. Didn't, of course. Japanese did not. Um, the Portuguese did not. Yeah. I think that's it. The problem yeah. is during the war, though, if this is limited to the war context, these are all bottlenose 6.5 yeah, millimeter cartridges with very little variance between them. They're really not that different. I mean, 6.555 is not. Somehow superior to 6.5 Carcano in significant ways mm -hmm. that I would even notice as an average soldier until they do the Spitzer thing all post war. Right. So they're all roughly equivalent. Like, no, I mean, not dead on. But no, but they're pretty close. Dang near. So that's sort of the problem is they're, they're fairly similar. Now, when you get into this, the other cartridges, you get more differences because they actually Spitzered. But the 6.5s generally did not Spitzer in time for World War I. I can't think of one that did Spitzer in time for I'm World War I. I'm trying to, but I'm blanking. Yeah, I might be missing one, but I don't I don't think so. Sorry. That's anyway. Me. Hopefully some of you are yelling at your screen that we got this one wrong, because we did. And I should know better, because we already did the Japanese Type 38 episode. The 6.5 uh, cartridge that came with that rifle was Spitzered. A very early Spitzer, as a matter of fact, so good job Japan. You probably had the best 6.5 cartridge of the World War I era. Um, let's see, next question. What firearm or firearm accessory for World War I small arms was clearly from the This Will Be Awesome School of Manufacturing but failed hard and stands out to you? Patterson. Yeah, pretty much. It, it, it's rad. It's a cool idea, but dang, if it didn't fail miserably. Webley Fosbury. Oh, yeah. There's a rad on paper. Not so great in practice. Um, there's got to be other ones that we're missing. Yeah. There's been a lot that just, you, they just don't run as well as you would think. It's usually the auto loaders. I mean, the Ross was a rad concept, and then he had to keep fixing and fixing and fixing and fixing until it became, like, actually workable. Yeah, the Ross is also one of those, like, seems really cool, but then you're like, there's a lot of helical cuts in here, mm -hmm. and it's very heavy. Like, mm -hmm. worse than the 1917 heavy. Stupid heavy. Yeah, that's another good one. Yeah. I can't think of anything else. That's but, pretty good, though. All right, what's the next one? <laughs> Uh, what prototype weapon concept of the World War One era do you think would be the most effective? Looks like you gave yourself some notes Good here. Good idea. Let yeah. me see. Well, uh, oh, yes, definitely. Um, 
so the problem is most of the prototype stuff is garbage, <laughs> as we've learned. But uh, I have handled a, I haven't gotten to shoot it, but I've handled uh, the Mune carbine, which was yeah. larger capacity magazine, shorter rifle, still 8mm, no. I don't think it was an 8mm lapel. I think, it was in, I think it was in that 6.8 cartridge. Oh, God, I'm messing myself up a little bit. But I, the Mune is easily the most potent, the, the most potential semi-automatic rifle that I'm familiar with, especially in the carbine form. Mm -hmm. um, the later RSC carbines. Oh, yeah, the 18 Yeah, they yeah. never got to production, but they seem to be significantly better than the RSC 1917. Mm -hmm. And even though they're an 8mm Lebel, you're still getting semi-automatic out of a five-shot versus bolt-action five-shot. So, yeah, that's pretty rad. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I don't know that you'd call it a prototype, more limited release, but same issue. Um, there's probably something to the Fedorov. Mm -hmm. However, I have not handled a Fedorov, and I have certainly not shot a Fedorov. I haven't even gotten my hands on one no. to photograph. And I have often found that the more storied the mythological gun, the worse it is when you actually get it in. So the problem is I'm still speculating on both of these because what ultimately happens is most prototypes are prototypes because they're prototypes. Right. So They didn't make it out past that stage for a reason. Yeah, when we think of a lot of the U.S. stuff is technically prototype. Um, if you really think about it, because a lot of the U.S. stuff only served two, three months right at the end of the war, which mm -hmm. would be the same equivalency as like the Fedorov that barely got out the gate or the RSCs that barely got out the gate. Not the big one, but the later ones. Mm -hmm. So we tend to think of Winchester 97s as standard issue. They weren't. They were very, very new. And we tend to think of like the BAR as standard issue. I mean, there was more than the shotguns, but they were still very, very new. They were still in field trials, essentially. Right. Um, so pretty much the whole U.S. inventory was pretty prototype, which if you stop and think about it, is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Because with the limited prep time and the fact that they were still in trials, the 1917 Browning, the BAR 1918 auto rifle, are both exceptional. Oh, yeah. For how little that they had going on. I know the BAR stinks as a light machine gun, but that's not what they were using it for. No. Um, it was a good auto rifle. Mm -hmm. And then um, the, the Winchester 97 proved to be not as utilitarian as they thought. But other than the cartridge issues, the gun itself was doing quite well. Although that was a different case because that was a well-established, reliable commercial shotgun. That then just got dragged in and they put a heat shield on it. Right. And they found that the ammunition was a severe problem. Um, so, yeah. Very cool. All right. Uh, let's see. Which firearm, z in the parentheses, have you guys come across that has a disastrous development story that would be the fitting subject of a collaborative episode with, well, there's your problem podcast? Uh, Remember I've, that podcast? No, I've never listened to it. Um, I tried looking it up real quick. Yeah. Um, I believe they described themselves as exploring... I want to say it was like exploring uh, de engineering disasters and their effects, but they very specifically said with like um, a leftist perspective. That's and, interesting. So they put their politics into it then. Right. So I don't, I'd have to listen to that. Like, Weird. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Um, what does it mean from a leftist perspective? Right. So that's the one part where I was just like, and again, In engineering specifically, I just didn't have time to sit down and listen to one. So I don't know how that podcast approached the topic. If I was just doing it for a quote unquote engineering disaster podcast mm -hmm. and there was no politics involved then i can answer that i think i, did I put some notes on here because i was here. trying not to forget some stuff um oh yeah yeah i remember um eight millimeter label cartridge okay because just from the title of it well there's your problem the number of sort of ripple effects from trying to have that eight millimeter label cartridge that is one of the clearest disasters in arms design which is that you've got the most advanced cartridge in the world and simultaneously the worst advanced cartridge in the world like that because you're Instantly. because you're too much of a hurry. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, I think that stands out very much, especially in World War One, because there's echoes of it. Imagine if the French had been trying to do what they were doing with automatic rifles and weren't slaved to the 8mm Lebel. The French probably could have had the most advanced firearms of World War One by an order of magnitude if they had not been restricted by that cartridge. True. That would be quite terrifying yeah. and interesting to think of how things might have turned out if that had been the case. Yeah. And then there's a bunch of little examples of just internal politics stuff like like, like Brixia and Glacenti pixel. Mm -hmm. uh, Brixia and Glacenti. Glacenti and Brixia pistols, which are both Ravelli designs. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the, you those, are, happy to those are minor problems compared to the 8mm Lebel cartridge. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. Um, 
Has there been a design for a firearm you've come across that you looked at and went, man, if only they changed this one tiny thing about it, this would have been amazing. If so, what was that change? Can you think of any? Because I put some notes for myself. Um, like I'm trying to think of something on the wall. See, you're just guessing at it. Now. Well, no, the problem is, is that I'm trying to think of First anything. First of all, like every gun that doesn't have a semi pistol grip stock for you, I know you. Well, okay, yeah, sure. It, it, you, yeah, okay. No, I can't argue with that. Like, it's something as simple as that. Like, on the Serbian carbine, that would have been nice. Mm -hmm. Things like that. But, but they're still pretty good guns, though. Yeah, they're still pretty good guns. It wouldn't have made, like, a massive change, I don't think. Um, I would say probably one of the biggest things that could have happened to Europe. Mm -hmm. That might have changed the post. I think it would change modern day um, potentially. Hmm. Is if the Steyrhan had detachable magazines. Yeah, that would have been awesome. The Steyrhan would have jumped because leaps and bounds above the others. Luger's preeminence comes from not just its utility and styling, but also its detachable magazine. Mm -hmm. If you put the Luger up against the Steyrhan, the Luger wins only because of the detachable magazine. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else that sets the Luger. As a matter of fact, the Steyrhan is superior. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Steyrhan is superior to Luger in terms of handling and use and all that stuff, except for the magazine. Uh, speaking of magazines that Lugers use, uh, if they'd done the MP18 with like a stick mag or something like that, because they did yeah. that later on, that would have been really cool to have earlier on. Yeah, they did that for backwards compatibility uh, with the Luger. Yeah, that would have been rad. That would have been pretty easy to tote around, To too. be fair, though, they ended up doing that, so... It was yeah. later on, though, yeah. Um... No, I think, sorry, to stay on the Steyrhan for a second, though. Sorry, uh, I just wanted to make sure I got that out. Yeah, I think if you had had a detachable magazine for the Steyrhan, there's a significant chance that the, the 9mm Steyr cartridge would have become much more standardized in Europe. Um, although, part of the reason for standardization on 9mm Pelbem was also probably because the C96 was rechambered for it as well, and now you had two pistols chambering 9mm Parabellum, and then the, it starts to flow. Sure. But before the C96 went to 9mm Parabellum, the game was pretty open. As a matter of fact, the 9mm cartridge that really dominated would have been Largo because it was available in the Bergmans. And then you see Spain using it with Campo Giro. Mm -hmm. um, and then immediately post-war, you see it into the Astra series of pistols. You see Largo showing up. It's mostly Spain doing it. Mm -hmm. But you see more Largo pistols appearing even faster than Parabellum pistols. It's mm -hmm. not until like World War II where Parabellum reasserts its preeminence. And I have this funny feeling that if you had a bunch of Steyr Hans laying around that were better than Luger's, that were, you know, with detachable magazines, there's a slim chance you could see 9mm Steyr become a more standard handgun cartridge. Got a weird one. They could have um, gone through on some revolvers, and I, I've mentioned some of them before where the hammer was just so heavy, but on things like the Smith & Wesson number no. 3, it had that little trigger spur that popped out the bottom oh, that really that helped spur? with the hammer. Some some revolvers really could have benefited from that and would have made operating the hammer <laughs> single-handedly fantastically easy. You just want more trigger spurs. Yeah, they were dope. Why aren't the modern revolvers? Where's your trigger spurs? Yeah, come on. Get on that. All right, what's else? All right, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, there we go. Uh, has there ever been a design for a firearm you come across that you looked at? Oh. Yeah, no, that's what I just said. Yeah. Are there any guns you've tested which would be better suited to a different use than they were given? Like any of uh, less favored guns redeemed with a change in usage? No. Well, no, yeah, all of them are not by the Not by the end of the war, because by the end of the war, guns were being used in their correct positions. They've been tested enough that they were then being used in correct well, positions. Well, utility was dictating by the end of the war. Mm -hmm. I will say, before that, the clearest misuse of firearms was light machine guns. Yes. They were not being fielded on the ground effectively, and it also took a while to get them stripped and into the air effectively. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of firearms designs that could have been better positioned pre-war. Um, and really the only one that was... Well, there's firearms designs that could have been done better before anything pre-war, but if you look at heavy machine gun tactics pre-war, Germany and Russia actually had heavy machine guns figured out. Hmm. Russia didn't commit to them as heavy as they could have been. Actually, Russia should have been the best machine gun user of the war, but they their culture meant that the officers were nervous about fielding them. Germany fielded them very well and also had good doctrine like Russia. Mm -hmm. Britain was the... Like, France was probably even a little bit better than Britain, but still not quite as doctrinally set with machine guns. And then Britain quickly overtook some of the others and started using them more effectively because they learned their lessons very quickly. Right. But... Overall, in terms of the world, people knew how to use 
machine guns effectively before the war. They mm-hmm. just suddenly everybody had to realize that they knew how to do that. Mm-hmm. Light machine guns doctrinally changed in World War One. They were misapplied and then applied correctly. That, I think, is really where the difference is. Yeah. That's pretty cool, though, that they yeah. at least corrected on it in time. Right. All right. Let's see. What else? Um, what firearm do you find the most fascinating, regardless of its actual functionality? Mm. Well, um, I, I remember answering this. We talked about this one yesterday. I said the Webley Fosbury. Yeah, it is fascinating. I mean, it's fascinating, but functionality-wise, it just doesn't really work very well. Yeah, it's completely useless. And then mm-hmm. oh, I had a note in here. Where is it? Oh, yeah, I remember. Um, sorry, some of these I was working on late in the night, and I had some more ideas when I was reading them for yeah, the first fair. time. Uh, there's one I have not been able to get a hold of. I mean, I've, I've, I've handled two examples of it in various states of disrepair, mm-hmm. but I've never been able to play with it. I've never had enough time to start and really play with it, but there's a, um, a late war German gun that was not really fielded called the gas gun. And it's a twin barrel with this like like alternating actuating. Oh, you arm. were telling me about this a while back. Yeah, I'm really fascinated about the feed and the disconnect and all the other stuff on it's that gun. It's interesting. Um, and I just haven't sat down to play with one, so I'd really like to dig into that gun one day. And I just haven't had the opportunity yet. I mean, I've had the opportunity, but not the time. Mm-hmm. So, uh, quick okay. pause. All right, next one. Uh, in the repercussion series, what's your opinion on using Indian-made muskets slash pistols, and have you considered using them? Um, I haven't done any research on the reliability of those, but assuming that on the end indiv- I would do the research to the individual gun and use whatever's available. I don't, I don't really care where it comes from as long as it's trustworthy. Yeah. Um. Because we need to be able to operate it. Yeah, and then there's also a level of responsibility of not maybe encouraging people to use dangerous things. Um, yeah. But I don't know what the context is on this. I mean, we did just use the Blanton hand thrower, so... <laughs> <laughs> That yeah, thing but, is dangerous. Yeah, but it's, that's cool. No, um, I assume that there's some sort of quality issue with the Indian reproductions mm-hmm. that you're concerned about. But if if they work, they work. Uh, most of this stuff that's like, you know, black powder, muzzle loading, whatever, is designed like the original designs were like iron or brass or whatever. So even being made quote unquote poorly somewhere. Generally, they're going to work fine because they the manufacturing it was high end for its time, but is very low for modern machines, even in uh, at the low end. Mm-hmm. So if it works, it works. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. Uh, what imp- which improvements do you think had the be- biggest impact on firearms design turn of the century? Metallurgy, machine tools, or test equipment? This is a hard one. Um, yeah, this one you really, you were telling me about last night, you kind of had to think on it for a minute. It's very difficult because it depends on what we're talking about. Test equipment is... Do you think it depends on what country you're talking about? Smokeless powder came about because of instrumentation. Mm-hmm. Um, the, develop, the inventor figured out how to record the progression of an explosion. Mm-hmm. And then through that, managed to fine tune the powder through various media, and then came up with a smokeless, very like uh, a powder that became more potent the more compressed it was in its own environment. Right? So in that instance, the tool was what started that. That would be testing equipment. Yeah. The, the instrumentation. Okay. However, I suspect in terms of we start thinking about machine guns and other things like that. Mm-hmm. Metallurgy to me is this slow march, and it's critical, but it just it just kept marching. And it's mm-hmm. one of those things that I wish I could get more history on because there's probably very brilliant men that figured out very brilliant things chemically, essentially, mm-hmm. to get better steel. But it's very hard to talk about just making slightly better steel over and over again. Right. Um, and it's absolutely crucial. However, if you think about firearms design, in the actual design and implementation of firearms, I think it's going to be the machine tool technology. Okay. Um, because that allows you to make more complicated systems easier. Mm-hmm. If you had to hand make, no matter how good the steel, no matter how good the powder or whatever else, if you had to hand make all your guns... It would be an impossible we'd task. Be, we'd be a muzzle loader lane. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it'd just be so expensive to mm-hmm. produce anything in the complexity of a machine gun. Um, so I'm going to have to go with the machine tool technology. Sure. Makes sense to me. All right. Uh, what would World War One? 
Yeah, what what World War One firearm had the greatest impact? Is what I think he meant to say. Wait, what? He meant to say what World War firearm? Uh, what would War One <laughs> yeah. firearm have the greatest impact? So what what World War One firearm had the greatest impact? I believe is what he's trying to say. Um, Bull Bell. Right. Well, well, I mean, think about it. Uh, eight millimeter Lebel cartridge. Oh, but that's not a World War One firearm. No. Well, that's that smoke with powder way before. Yeah, that's true. Um, Wait, is, is it specifically rifle or is it just no, no, firearm? no, it's firearm. Oh. Um, oh God. Well, it kind of had an impact in that it changed a concept. The MP18. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking the MP18 definitely defined the submachine gun category. Yeah, technically the Villa Perosa came but before then that in 1914, guns, though, right? They kind of beca- well, the submachine gun becomes very effective for World War II in certain contexts, and then today we really don't use it as much. Mm-mm. You know what I mean? I really think, as much as I want to say the MP18, I'm going to say probably like the Lewis gun. Because, Just because it establishes a groundwork for what becomes the standard light automatic machine gun. Is it perfect? No. No. But I don't think you get to the MG34 without having a taste of the Lewis gun. Mm. Um, the MG08 15 is really the track that they took to get to the 34. Mm-hmm. But I really suspect the, the expectation of both weight and firepower was probably set by the Lewis gun more so than the 0815. Okay. Um, maybe the combination of the two, but again, it's definitely light machine guns because light machine guns then start getting put in all sorts of places. Yeah, that's um, true. They did make a, a drastic change. And they remain relevant today, much more so than submachine guns. That's fair. So, okay, there's sure. my call. All right, uh, let's see. How many weapons in the Great War had an impact um, their counterparts di- that their counterparts didn't? I'm paraphrasing. Okay. Uh, that is to say, any rifles, pistols, mortars, whatever, so much better than other rifles, pistols, mortars, whatever, that they actually were noted to change the outcome of an engagement. Change the outcome of an engagement? Yeah, that's what the question is. Artillery, yes. Yeah. Um, machine guns to a degree, but mostly because they were there or not. I don't know that you had a machine gun design that was so superior to another one. That it just right. a- altered the outcome At the beginning of the war, the, Fr- the French 745 did amazing damage. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, to the point that it countered the German machine gun. You know what I mean? So you have this sort of asymmetrical uh, art- good artillery versus good machine gun, right? Mm-hmm. And then... Um, you start having German heavy guns that can really send it, mm-hmm. and they're breaching fortifications, which really ruins any attempt at fortification, so Belgium and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, like Fortress Belgium goes down because of German heavy guns. Mm-hmm. Um, so artillery definitely had great effect, but I'm not an artilleryman. Right. Um, in the machine gun world, it's really just about fielding them and fielding them properly. It's not really about the individual gun. Light machine guns, like I said, the Lewis gun really sets you up for an understanding of what is, so that there's an answer there. Sure. Um, so I think the Lewis gun stands out very strongly against other light machine guns, and we've proven that. Perhaps the one light machine gun we've never tested is the Bergman 15. Yeah. Um, n- not the other Bergman. It's confusing. But um, I haven't been able to run that gun, so who knows? That might be up there with the Lewis gun. I've never gotten to run it. Um <sighs> What else could have been like? The only other thing is I can think of specifics. So like rear aperture sights. It could be. So like the 1917, but I don't think that changed the tide of battle. I just think the rear aperture sight on the 1917 stood out so much so that the U.S. went to rear apertures. Britain went to rear apertures eventually. Like And something like stocked pistols had a good potential, but they didn't really change No, outcomes. they just led to the submachine gun, though. Right. Yeah. They were just a leading in development. Right. They just Stocked pistols made you go, oh, we just made this oh, wait, auto. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> So, eh, there's my answer. Sure. Oh, uh, let's see. How did World War One soldiers typically clean their firearms? Did they have access to jags and patches and solvents like modern shooters, or did they use something else? This would depend on the army. Yeah. Um, by World War One, especially mid-war, uh, you're really seeing most cleaning being done with pull-throughs, like rope and you know, just like That's a little, something you can easily a br- like a, a, a pack away. like a copper wire brush. I'm not even sure, maybe brass, but a wire brush. Woven into it, like a boar snake. We mm-hmm. still have, I mean, I probably have some laying around here. Yeah, like, I mean, this is much more advanced in that it's got a big poofy cotton thing. Right. But the idea is you have a length of rope, you have a scrubber to some degree. Mm-hmm. Um, usually, I don't think that they would have this sort of oversized thing at the end at that point, but you, you get the idea, right? Mm-hmm. You, you would pull through 
And that was how you clean because this tended to be the most convenient and the least likely to get damaged or whatever else. And then you occasionally know? it would either be packed in your on your body somewhere, or be packed in the gun if it had a little. Yeah, you could get a little trap in the butt. You have it with your ammo bag, maybe um, uh, or pouches. Um, mm -hmm. Some armies still had uh, older style cleaning rods yep. on certain guns, but usually most rods were clearing rods, not cleaning rods. Right. The ones that were still cleaning rods generally were not full. Like you'd have to mm -hmm. attach them to the, either other people's cleaning rods, or you'd have like a the unit would have like a like a, a stick that they took around as the care for the whatever, mm -hmm. and you would attach yours to it. You'd use it and then hand it off to Frank and attach his to it or whatever, Frank. which tells you why the pull through became really popular because mm -hmm. that's a big mess to deal with. Right. Um, and so that was generally how you clean it up: just some oil and a pull through, um, and then just wiping it out. Um, okay. I think. You would have some care kits, uh, depending on the army and the type of arm, you would have some care kits at sort of a unit level mm -hmm. so that you could do those sort of field service things, but then anything above that, you're, you're back to the armor anyway. Sure. Okay. Um, let's see here. How do you clean and maintain your guns, especially the ones on the wall? Do you have a long-term schedule for cleaning and re-oiling? Uh, number one, we try to control the humidity. Yeah. Um, Charleston is very humid, which helps and doesn't at the same time because mm -hmm. the balance is, it's like a humidor. You got to just kind of keep it right. Right. Uh, I tend to use, it's good and it's not good, but I tend to use anything, any, any wood that I want to store something on that makes a lot of contact. I use a harder wood that's less likely to absorb moisture when it's actually making contact because I don't want it to hold moisture against the gun. Mm -hmm. But stuff that's not really resting as much, softer woods are good to have around because they'll take on moisture before the wood stocks will. You yeah. know, it's nice. Um, sort of like a desiccant, you know, just right there. Uh, keep the dust off as best you can. Yep, give them wipe downs. Um, and then I tend to just use, uh, I have a couple of tricks that I like. Um, number one, don't be afraid of like warm water and dish soap as the first thing to clean your stocks. Mm -hmm. Unless they're completely unsealed and the grain is still proud, then it gets a little weird. Because mm -hmm. you've got other problems then. You need, right. That's you got a whole treatment if you have, process. If you, have, if you have proud grain on your stock where it's just unfinished and poofed up and everything, that's time to maybe get out the the cloth, the rough cloth with some uh, a little bit of diluted boiled and seed oil, wipe it in there, mm -hmm. keep building it up till it has a little bit of like polish to it, polish it down, maybe wax it. Mm -hmm. um, but what I tend to do is I try not to go for BLO right away um, because boiled and seed oil will darken a gun over time. Um, if I have a gun that have gouges or something like that that are really white, I'll go ahead and hit with some BLO, seal mm -hmm, it back up. Mm -hmm. um, it'll darken in the cracks. That's fine. Um, a thing that people don't use enough, I think, is just some basic like wood wax. Um, just a little wood wax because it really doesn't hurt the gun. Right. If it doesn't have any color to it, it's really good. Um, so a light waxing really helps. The trick with that is you got to keep the dust off. Mm -hmm. um, as far as metal goes, I'm a big fan of Ballastol. And from the black powder guys, they make what they call moose milk because yeah, that stuff is interesting. Ballastol dilutes into I actually have it here. Ballastol dilutes into water, and it doesn't really separate. Like there's a little tiny bit of separation in this bottle because it's really been sitting for a couple I weeks. Think it's, yeah, literally been sitting but, in the same spot for a few weeks. I mean, I just shook it once and it immediately went away, and then mm -hmm. I kept shaking out of habit. But um, very consistent product. But what you can do is with diluted um, ballastol, you can either spray or wipe it in. And then uh, the water will evaporate off if you're not leaving them in a place where water won't evaporate. Right. Um, and it leaves a nice little oil layer. Mm -hmm. And so that's really good for the metal. Um, black powder guys really swear by that to not have to have rust. And those guys know about rust. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, ballastol, moose milk, a little bit of wax if you need BLO on occasion. On occasion. Um, but oh, really not as complicated off. as you think. Uh, really the big problem with storing firearms is people will leave them up against things that are poisonous to them. Right. Uh, you don't think about it, but, uh, it's like I used to do framing in college, like mm -hmm. picture framing. Uh, never use a cardboard backer because cardboard has an acidity to it that will eventually destroy the document in front of it. Same thing. Cardboard will eat up on bluing. Mm -hmm. You just don't think about it. Uh, leather. Some people, yeah. Leather. I was about to say, leather leather dies, their gun case in leather or something like that. Tannin, and it's like, oh. Yeah. They can tear it up. Um, a lot of times people just put it in a, a, a hard case or something, or something yeah. Or and just having that material on there, some some moisture gets in there, you don't realize it. 
and it just sits there and sits there and sits there. Mm -hmm. So it's more about what the gun's up against, minimizing contact with the environment. What is it touching for the longest amount of time? Yeah, minimizing environmental contact and keeping humidity right is nine-tenths of it, and then the rest is just some Just general clear. Yeah. Yeah. All right, what's next? What are your opinions on Milserp stock maintenance? What, if anything, do you do with your stocks? Uh, I think oh, I yeah. just Literally just answered that. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, uh, warm, soapy water. If, you're, if your grain's proud after that, your gun's not sealed up very well. So maybe a little boiled linseed oil. Just be careful not to, like, go crazy and darken your stock over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like, some waxing and polishing, and it should be fine. Mm-hmm. And people go religious with that stuff. They get a high sheen and stuff. But for military stuff, just... A layer of wax, wipe it down, make sure what you really don't want is you don't want that porous, puffy grain going on because Mm -hmm. I've got, um, I don't know where it is. There's a, there's a Spanish gun behind May that I got in. That's just for for whatever reason, it feels like it's, it's worn its finish. You want me to grab it? No, it's all right. You can't see it on camera anyway. You feel it. It's a texture issue. Okay. And so that gun's going to get a waxing. Like I'm I'm going to sit there and I'm going to touch it up with any BLO it needs if it's got any scratches. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, cause generally if you have a fresh scratch and it's got that bright color to it, yeah. done, it's already scratched. So I'll just take some BLO and get it down in there and let it sit, hit it a couple times so, so it darkens. evens it out. Yeah. Yeah. And then wipe it out and then wax the whole thing and it looks nice. Sure. Okay. So. All right. Let's see. Aside from browning a Colt, which firearm designer could use a Tiger King style Netflix limited series? Hiram Burden. Is that... That oh, one's been your favorite oh so far because you've been looking into the research on him recently. Uh, yeah, so well, I'm working on the Bernan episode. Right. Ross is Spoilers. an insane man. You know what I mean? Ross yeah. is an insane man. Oh, yeah. He could just have his own. I mean, like, you could do movie. a whole a biography on Ross. Would look, Go read it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Browning is actually not that interesting as a person hmm. because he's a hardworking dude who just does his job. Colt's an interesting person. Yes. Colt was a son of a bitch. <laughs> um, and that makes for fascinating listening. Right. Um, and I'd really love to just talk about Colt. But then I thought Colt must be the most interesting man ever in the firearms industry in terms of just being a rapscallion. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? How are we going to have a Hiram Burdan? He's surpassing Colt? I almost want to kill him myself. Wow. I mean, just just from the, what I'm reading, just an insane narcissist that just keeps getting away with it. And it's just unbelievable. That's impressive. Yeah, I can't wait to talk about even... The problem is I won't... The way this episode started, I really can't get into it. Um, I'm just going to have to <laughs> briefly be like, you should really read this book. But like... Uh, by all accounts, just just a nutter in a lot of ways. Okay. But yeah. Um, look up. Look up him. Yeah. Okay. Another pause for the next question. What page are we on? Uh, we are on page six. Of we're about halfway through it. Of fifteen, but the fifteenth page is, is just one question. Th- okay, six. So maybe 14. we're looking at fourteen, kind of. Sort of. <laughs> you did do weird large spacing. We're and doing these also... once a year, and they're going to get w- if we keep growing. It. Mm, anyway, keep going. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what, who would you say was the best dressed of World War I, both in terms of uniform, practicality, and outright style? You're not very good on uniforms, are you? No, I'm terrible. Can you pick one on style? I mean, I don't know what country, but I know some of them had really poofy hat feathers that, Mm -hmm. like, flip forward. Like the Arditi in Italy? I guess. Again, I don't know country uniforms very well. Yeah, girls. Girls don't know clothes. I did... I haven't really looked into it. Mm. So uh, I'm going to have to go with. Oh, you're cheating. You wrote down notes for yourself. Yeah, I did write down notes. Yeah. You didn't even you could have stolen them. I wasn't going to do that. I'm not going to be that person. To be fair, I had to write down notes. Also, I had to be talking out of my butt because I don't remember these two countries. I'm not a great uniform guy, but I was trying to be like, okay, I think. And I had to double check. Mm-hmm. So number one. For utility, probably the Austrian school of thought. So, you know, Austria ha- tend to have simple, straightforward uniforms, sh- sh- um, chest pockets. Like, it just seems utilitarian. Mm-hmm. Um, Austria, despite, other than the little filigree that goes with it, the Austrian uniforms don't tend to look all that different from semi-modern military uniforms. Okay. Like, um, and then you see lots of countries that sort of, take from that. So like Romania, I think, had a similar pattern because they went to the same sort of utilitarian idea. Sure. Um, basically, the antithesis of the French, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Uh, in terms of style, it's got to be the Belgians, right? Do they have all that style, all that flair? The Belgians are like the, they're vaguely like the French uniforms in some ways and in other ways, a lot of them are just their own thing. Is that how but they became the nanny? The Bel- Some of the Belgian uniforms, you feel like you could wear to a wedding, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, what? 
I said that if they had the style, they had flair. That's how they became the nanny. Da, 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 da. Oh my god. I see I see why you don't know uniforms, because that's what your head's full of. <laughs> I've got the uh the movie about the whatever the beautician saved in my oh Amazon. My god. So I'll take a look at it. Okay. <laughs> Keep going. Got off topic there a little yeah, bit. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. It's already started. Uh, what would you choose in order to make the Albonian army as ineffective as possible, uh, July 1914? So this is probably Ian's fault. Okay, so this is a whole series of these because okay. you guys love a meme. Let me look at these questions. I'm it's like a focus on memes. All right. Because he did a Q&A and then did a whole right. thing on so it. Right, so the fresh. <laughs> Okay, July 1914, what would you do to make the Albonian army as ineffective as possible? Mm -hmm. And the, Ian has a whole workup for this because he liked the question. It was very novel. The problem is now I have 14 versions of this question. <laughs> so uh, as ineffective as possible without getting into weird – because Ian did this thing where he wanted to, like, give them the worst cartridges to interchange and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Let's just get through some of the best and worst because really what this ends up being is, is I end up with a bunch of lists of best and worst stuff from World War I. Oh, okay. Which sure. gets really – Boring? No, it's just that each one is like, but this date, but that date, but what? So yeah, it's, it's like, literally like date it's focus. Rehashing it's rehashing like the same. 1915. It's the rehashing the same best and worst guns just at different times of the year. Right. So, July 1914, worst guns. Bertier three shot. A Glacenti pistol, because yeah. it's just awful and very expensive. Mm -hmm. And then uh, probably for machine gun, the Fiat Revelli, but I'm not really yeah. sure. And I can't give you a submachine gun because they're not really a thing yet. I mean, I guess maybe Villa the Villa Perosa, Perosa like, that's around. It was 1914, sometime. Yeah, which would go with the Glacenti pistol. Yeah, that's true. But then that's true. convenient, so I have to make it two different cartridges, according to you. Right. So um, <laughs> I feel like they would know that I was f***ing with them if I did that. So um, I'm going to have to bleep that. <laughs> Yeah, so the Bird Day 3 shot Glacenti pistol and probably the Fiat Revelli, although I don't have personal experience with the Fiat Revelli, I just suspect that it's probably not the easiest machine gun to work mm -mm. and keep running. Okay, so then, and I'll go ahead and handle these for a second. You recently learned uh, how Albonia has decided to arm its forces from uh -huh. Ian in 1945. So, uh -huh. in order to understand this one, you would have to go watch Ian's Q&A number 40, and thankfully he gave me the timestamp, thank you for that part of this, at 54 minutes and 23 seconds. Ian defines giving the Albonians the worst possible guns available at the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay. And he does a very good job, which is where the previous question comes from. And I did not do a very good job, but there's fewer options anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I'm planning to invade them, but I can only use weapons that were from 1917. So in other words, I think what he's setting up is... Yeah, I get the best weapons from 1917 mm -hmm. against the worst from 1945. Right. Is the theory. You think that's where he's going? Yes. Um, so, Ian got to just make up calibers to go with different guns. Right. So, in that regard, and it's 1917 Christmas, not 1918, which makes this harder. Mm -hmm. I'm stuck with. Wait, I thought you did want to do that one with 1918 instead because it was going to be too hard. No, no, I'm playing his rule. Oh, okay. Because I got to kind of, I can't do every version of this, so I'm going to do it as quickly as I can. Okay. okay? So, 1917 weapons, mm -hmm. right? Mm hmm If I can change cartridges radically, Colt 1911 in 9mm. Okay. If I can't do it radically, I'm going to do Steyrhan in 9mm. Sure, Steyrhan's a pretty good choice. Probably Parabellum, but it could be... The other one, I don't care. Right, can you get it stocked? Because... In 1917? No. Uh, then I have... So this is where it gets weird, because the SMG, I have, like, no options. Mm -hmm. If it's 1917, theoretically the MP18's in development, I would pick it if I could, right. but otherwise, for an SMG, I... All I, you really got is a Villa, Villa Perosa, Perosa, and That's all I got. You, what are you putting that on? I don't think bicycle? the OVP was in development, even, so... Mm -hmm. I guess I'm stuck with the Villa Perosa, so that could be in Parabellum or Styrohan. It doesn't matter. I could do either. It actually was chambered in both at one point, right. so... I mean, well, more Glacenti, but that's a whole other argument. Um, <laughs> then for the rifle, uh, the Munay carbine would have been by 1918. If I can't get that, it's the Munay rifle. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Munay carbine was available by 1516, though. It just wasn't really used because right. they switching ammo. So the Munay carbine, um, it had its own, uh, I think it was like 6 by 58, not 6.8. Maybe that's why I got confused. Yeah, I think that was it. You're right. Um, so the Mune carbine's fine in the cartridge it's in. If I have my choice, I'd probably try to run it in 7 mil because it's available and it's a good cartridge. Right. Um, 
for an LMG, I do the Lewis gun, light machine gun, Lewis gun. Yeah. Same chambering, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and then for a heavy machine gun, thankfully, I'm just in time for the Browning 1917s nice, development. Yeah. Um, but if I really can't do that, then I'm doing the Vickers. Mm -hmm. But that's those are probably the best. And they probably stand up pretty well, actually, yeah. if you went that route. Probably. Um, the only questionable thing is if the Munet is really that reliable or not. I don't know. Um, because if I'm looking for a reliable semi-automatic, uh, I got problems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I haven't really played with Dragons, but I know that they tend to beat themselves to death a little bit. Yeah. Um, oh, we've handled the RSCs. Yeah, no, not the RSCs. I mean, the RSCs is better than a bolt action, True. so don't laugh at it too hard. But it's completely, probably the RSC is totally unnecessary if you chamber it in something else. Yeah. So, okay, so then these keep going because it's it's still this thing. Don't do thing. that, don't do that. Okay, put it over there. Discard pile. Okay. Because then we get, if you were the head of a small European country ordnance department at the turn of the century, which pre-war series of rifles, pistols, and machine guns would you choose to equip your troops making sure this place... So this is in Albonia. Okay. This is just this a theoretical. Just, you have a small country. Poor Susie has wandered into the house and is trying to desperately move through it without <laughs> disturbing us while we're in the middle of this horrible question. But you can just walk. It's just a Q&A. Yeah. She's being very sweet. So, um... <laughs> It's like wandered at the beginning of this horrible set. All right, so we did the worst. Wait, we did on. the worst of 1914. Yeah, we did the worst of 1914. The best of 1917. Now 18. we're post, no, pre war. Okay, so before the war. Okay, I'm a pre small European country. Okay, what would I buy to be ready for the war? Okay, so this is going to upset everybody. Okay, I would buy the Carcano. I would do the Bodeo handgun, Lamb of Leg Bodeo, I know. But then I do the Vickers machine gun. Okay, so the Vickers kind of makes sense, right. but why the first two? Okay, I'm a small European country. Okay. They were almost all obsessed with cost, so I'm thinking like... So you've got a, a really tight budget is what you're thinking. I'm thinking about like Romania or Greece or whatever, right? The, I mean, both they of them, should not spend money. Well, they had these... They had bolt-action rifles that were lovely. Especially Greece had the most expensive tank bolt-action yeah. rifle. But then they had no machine guns. You know what I mean? And they had an inability to keep their forces equipped like everybody did. Mm -hmm. And then even more so, they don't have the ability to keep equipping their troops, right? So if I'm small European, the number one thing I'm going to go is everything's going to catch fire. It's like right now we have an ammo shortage in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Bet you wish you could make ammo at home. Pick as many as up as we can. Yeah, if you could make primers at home right now, you'd be loving to do it, right? Uh-huh. Same problem. You're going to want to make it at home. So I know, even as a small European country, Those two will be easy I can make Carcanos at home. And they work. They work. Mm -hmm. Is it ideal? No, but they work. I can make Bodeos at home. They're made out of iron. And they're dude simple. And I'm sorry, handguns were not that critical, especially in the early stages of the war. Mm -hmm. If I can survive the early stages, I'll buy rubies. Yeah, or you might be able to afford different. Actually, maybe I'll just give rubies. Actually, rubies might be better than Bodea. That's that true. Thing. You can oh, also okay. outsource production. Ruby. I'll do the ruby. I'll do the ruby handgun. 32 ACP. Who cares, right? It's not that critical. What I want is a machine gun. So you're going to funnel all your like d high dollar stuff into Vicar production. I can't afford to buy both a light machine gun or a heavy machine gun. I can't do both. So go for something Because that's that what Belgium can... tried to do. Belgium had all this French stuff laying around, and then they also tried to get the um, the Benny Mercy, the uh, Pochka Supportative in. Right. And now they have two different machine guns, and they don't have enough of them, and it's this half-implemented whatever. Sure. No. I'm going to be like, guys, I want the cheapest rifle, the cheapest handgun I can get, which is probably actually the Ruby in terms of performance to price. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll change that Ruby. But then I want to take every cent I save, and I want to put it on Vickers machine gun. Sure. Because that splits the difference between a light and heavy. It's very reliable, and it was very uh, before the war. So I'm going to put every dime I can in a properly trained Vickers machine gun crew and then support them with cheap Carcanos and Ruby pistols. Okay. <laughs> Sound fair? That seems reasonable to me. I mean, to be fair, this is all theoretical. Yeah. And then poor you, you're just like... <laughs> um, and then one more. It is 1919. <laughs> And you're ahead of arms. Wait, what's wrong with 1915? Why haven't we done 19? Why does everyone hate the no, date 1915? Well, oh yeah, God. Next next year it's going to be like okay, but it's, it's 1934 exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's 1915 August 5th. These are what? all we're laughing. These are all reasonable questions to get an overall thing, but they're all very involved, and there's yeah. there's variations of them. So and then like when you put them all up next to each other, you're just like oh okay. Yeah. Um. 
What was the question? Actually, hold on. Before I do that, there's another one in here. I just realized it lines up. You're in charge of uh, U.S. involvement in World War I. What guns and planning would you create before involvement in the war? So basically, what should the U.S. have been doing? And what the U.S. should have been doing is adopting the Vickers mm-hmm. and ramping. They did. The U.S. did a good job in terms of rifles. Um, with the 1903? No, not with the 1903. Um, we did not spin up 1903 production fast enough. Um, but it's very hard to do, so, oh well. Sure. If I'm U.S., right 1914, I'm I'm going to recruit ordnance personnel. There's other things you can do to prepare for infantry and artillery, but in terms of weapons production, we need ordnance officers yesterday, and the U.S. did not do enough to aggressively get in more ordnance officers, and they could have without spending nearly as much money as making the guns, mm-hmm. number one. The best thing the U.S. did was the 1917 rifle because they let Britain pay to tool that whole thing up and then they just wandered in and bought them afterwards. For, That's pretty easy. And they could get millions. of The 1917 is the most successful thing of U.S. involvement in World War I, period. Pretty thrifty. Right. We got millions of them at no development cost. Fantastic. Right? Sure. Um, not no because we did a better job. Right. Yeah, but very low. Yeah. Um, the thing that the U.S. screwed up, and nobody's going to like me for this, because in the end, the U.S. was right. The Browning 1917 turned out to be a very good gun. Mm-hmm. It was stupid that we banked on that so hard because the Vickers was just fine. It was available, and we could have been cranking it out. The real thing is they needed the U.S. needed to go in and shake Colt like by its roots mm-hmm. and say, get to work, because Colt really dragged us into a machine gun debacle. Um, so Vickers machine gun... Get rid of everything else. Forget the Benets. Forget everything else. Vickers machine gun right away and as many as you can get and start training machine gun crews yesterday. Mm -hmm. But there's all sorts of um, Val Browning and some of the others that we've talked about in our show have all sorts of reports about how bad the U.S. machine gun program was before the war. So the U.S. didn't even know what it was doing wrong. Mm -hmm. But if I could just magically make them know, machine gun, machine gun, machine gun, machine gun. You know what I mean? And then beyond that, you can talk about airplanes and stuff too because we didn't really get as much domestic production of things as we think we did. Mm -hmm. Um, We tend to confuse World War II with World War I. The U.S. was not nearly as ready for World War I despite the lead-up. the pumping from Europe in our arms economy helped, but not as directly as it did in World War II, where we really let Europe spin us up, and then we were like, yeah, and then we just threw more on the fire and ran with it. We did a better mm-hmm. job in World War II. Um, but that's what I think I would do. Did I explain that? I think Perfect. so. Yeah. So more ordnance officers, Vickers, and then the and rifles are doing fine. Uh, and then the 1917 revolver program worked out pretty well. You could have done that earlier, um, in addition to trying to get more 1911s in production. But handguns really aren't that critical, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Okay. Okay, so. Um, do you want to take a pause or are you going to try to answer no, that? No, I'm going to try one more. Okay. okay. It's 1919. You're ahead of arms procurement for your nation's forces and after witnessing, but not being involved in the now-ended Great War. So uh, basically I'm Switzerland or yeah. Norway or whatever. Uh, you're, I need to upgrade the military small arms. You're an inland country with the size and terrain similarities to the state of Montana. Okay, are you ready for my answer on this? Okay. Carcano, <laughs> Ruby Pistol, Vickers. It's the same answer. If Montana's not that big. No. I'm an inland country. But it's I'm not a major right? power, right? It's not miss. Yeah. If I saw World War I and I was worried that it was going to happen again, I would say we need a crappy pistol, a decent rifle, but inexpensive, and then we need to dump all, we're going to min max our stats on machine gun. And it's going to be light, so um, it doesn't have to necessarily be the Vickers. It could be the Browning. Browning is a good light machine gun, light or heavy machine gun. It's, mm-hmm. We're getting into weird territory here. But realistically, if I see World War One, if I'm psychic, I'm going to be looking at, like, airplanes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm going to look at mechanization. But that requires you to be really far out there. Tanks and airplanes are the bigger lesson, you know? Mm-hmm. But in terms of small arms, the small arms are getting way less important than um and germany had the right lesson from this germany reorganized around the light machine gun Mm -hmm. so it's going to be the same thing you're going to pick the best light or medium machine gun you can get so maybe like the vickers i don't think the the problem is i don't think there was a good enough universal light machine gun available right at the end of the war i'd be probably looking to develop my own which a lot of countries did but if i had to pick probably like go with the Browning 1917 as a stand-in until I could get a proper light machine gun. Because we see the Browning 1919 evolves from that, and it starts to have some, like, 
it's not great at being a light machine gun, but you can get it into that role, you mm -hmm. know. There's not a pure answer in 1919 for the real problem, which is what Germany ultimately develops when they go around to the 34, 42, that sort of thing. Sure. Um, but the rifle just falls way off of in terms of importance. I'd actually, I'd almost be inclined to go just make uh, Winchester 1907s or something. Or like just Remington Model 8s. a bunch of them. But the problem is then your unit cost per rifle gets really high when you could really be putting that energy into machine guns. And True. we know... Even with psychic powers, we know that you can survive with a bolt-action rifle for the initial stages of World War II anyway. Mm -hmm. And there's not anything to tell you that you have to do a semi-automatic rifle yet. So I'm putting on my theoretical history mm -hmm. blinders, you know. Yeah, you need a different hat for that. Yeah. So let's take one more pause and keep going. Sure. All right, we've taken a small break. We're back. Um, <laughs> well, we had popcorn. I ate popcorn. <laughs> yeah, I had some coffee. Okay. Uh, so let's see here. Next question. Your time machine has broken down. You're best. That's already a bad place anywhere. to be. Okay. And you're in the middle of the Great War. That's a bad place to be. Like in the middle of it? Where? Um, would you rather have a foul or a G3 for the trenches of the Western Front? This is hard. So is it hard because I feel like you're you're probably gonna prefer your foul. I'm gonna upset a lot of people. <clears throat> the problem is, theoretically, the G3 is the superior rifle in terms of actual utility. Mm -hmm. Although um, I am friends with Hawk and Spur, and he has designed a stock that makes the G3 way better. So. I assume it's a stock G3 because I just cannot stand the ergonomic. I cannot stand being behind a G3 unless it's got like a spur stock on it. Mm -hmm. um, but theoretically, G3 is better. Um, and people are going to start yelling and arguing, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I'm sure. However, in World War One, I, I might choose the fact <laughs> because in terms of the doctrine they were using, uh, and I've upset people saying this, the foul is the ultimate realization of the show shot's dream. That's true. The We've talked about this before. The foul is a large... The foul is a auto, light, automa light automatic rifle, a heavy automatic rifle, right? But it's a mm -hmm. full-powered cartridge automatic rifle with a, the, originally with a bipod. Some armies didn't do that. Semi or full auto, some armies didn't do that. Mm -hmm. But in general, the, the foul as a concept is everything the show Shaw wanted to be. And it upsets people when I say that, but the foul is everything the show Shaw wanted to be. So I'd probably just go with the foul because yes. they would know exactly what to do with me with that in, in that realm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So they'd probably like it. They'd probably be like, oh, we, we could make more of these. This is what Does we Does it need. also still have the handle on it so you can tote it around? Oh, yeah, definitely. I want okay. the handle. Yeah, the handle's yeah. necessary. Carry handle. Okay. All right, next one. Um... What modern military rifle or firearm, like a carbine or a PDW, um, like a P90 or your, your Caltech, uh, would be best suited for use in similar conditions to the Western Front and World War I, like horrible weather, mud and grit, cheap and easy for production? you have any opinions? Um, well, it's got to be something that's cheap and easy to produce. Mm -hmm. so, and it's got to be something that you can pump out a lot of right. them. So probably something like a bunch of AKs. Yeah. Assuming like just literally you're just, pl you're just <clears throat> pumping them out. Assuming the technology is there to do the stampings, because I'm not, if they could do stampings then, they just hadn't really applied them to I firearms. Don't know. So I don't know. Let me look at the phrasing on this. Uh, okay, modern would be best suited to similar, is it like an individual one? I'm thinking in, gr in terms of grouping, right? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> probably derivative of the AK. Um, there's lots of choices in there, and mm -hmm. the ergonomics are not always perfect, but then again, a lot of ergonomics were not perfect in World War One. No. Um, you're running into, I think intermediate cartridge is perfectly acceptable for most of the ranges that would have been in the trench war period, you know what I mean? You could leave full-powered cartridge with designated marksmen slash snipers. True. But I don't see why you couldn't run an intermediate cartridge select fire gun for trench combat, especially if it's one that's designed to seal up um, when not in direct use and one that sheds yeah, dirt very well. It would pretty much be able to push its way through. Yeah, and, and this, then... isn't, this isn't an AR-15 AK-47 fight mm -mm. because... 
I don't know why. I just feel like the AK is a little more rooted in that more that that earlier production technology. Um, you think it would be capable of production back then, potentially? Not only that, but okay. So I can't. And I know people are going to be oh, AK AR fifteen. The AR fifteen benefits greatly from modern ammunition mm -hmm. in one clear regard. And I get I've, I've wrangled people as a joke, but it's very real. The charging handle at the rear means that you have a rear gas point right at your eye level right. at the rear of that receiver. And wartime ammo for World War I was so bad. I want to be clear. Mm -hmm. It was so bad that Winchester ammunition was blowing 1917 receivers on occasion. That's pretty bad. That's very bad ammo. <clears throat> bad consistency. So that's a worst case scenario, but a lot of ammo was very inconsistent. And I feel like there's a little bit more ugga dugga with the AK. Fair. I haven't sat down and done a complete study on the two. I just, it's, for it, my money. That's I, what I'm just thinking. Like, you, you brought up a better technical point on it. Right. There's, there's all sorts of benefits to the other system, you know. And again, mm -hmm. we're only looking at two. There's other systems out there. We could be looking at all sorts of stuff. We could be looking at, you know, Galils or something, you know, mm -hmm. which is derivative. But, um, and then there's completely different weapon systems entirely that might have done better, like, um, they probably could have handled manufacturing something like a VZ-52, the rifle. Yeah. Which is a 762 by 45 cartridge and generally has a folding bayonet and looks like something that could have worked in World War One. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I'm not that familiar with the operating system of that gun that would it be that producible at that time? Actually, probably. So like there's guns that we could consider otherwise. Mm -hmm. But if it's me, um, you're looking at the show shot. The show shot's made out of a lot of uh, stamp steel, but sort of bolted together more yeah. so than actually formed like an AK is. But it gives you a suggestion that the show shot was very successful being produced in numbers. The AK is sort of in that same vein of being able to produce in numbers with uh, simple sheet steel technology. Um, I suspect there is a version of the AK that you could make in that conflict if you had, yeah, had the mindset that's what I'm to thinking. do it. Also, if you look at the if you look at some of the functional groups of the AK, they're not too dissimilar from like a Remington Model 8 in ways that people are often surprised by. And the Shosha and the RC also have functions that are very derivative of the Remington Model 8. I suspect the AK is actually far more related to the Shosha than we realize, or the RC. So it's Sorry. potentially easily to, pro easy, they're potentially able to produce them, potentially able to mass produce them, and at least some derivative of it. Yeah, I do think loosely, and I have not sat down and studied every feature, I think That's loosely the AK's yeah. in that family. That's where I'm at. Yeah. Although I like your point out about the ammunition, like that was a good point. I didn't think about that. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things we forget. We really do, in terms of modern semi-automatics, we, we are graced by far superior ammunition. The ammunition quality, even in World War II with all the problems, what leaps and bounds better than World War One. Mm -hmm. Metallic cartridge in mass production was not an easy science that did not go as well as people think it did. Yeah, so you can't just hot drop something like the AR in there. Right. All right, um, so you've tasked with, you've been tasked with organizing the first Albonian dino regiment. What sort of dinosaur would you choose and with what weapon would you equip the riders? Oh, I mean, you. yeah, I know. I feel like a Triceratops is a is pretty- Is Triceratops real or not real now? Wait, that was a thing, wasn't it? Is yeah. that like Pluto now where it's like, nah, it's not really a thing. So in theory, Triceratops or Triceratops-like object. I think they just, they're pretty sturdy. Okay. Um, and they have, they have good like front defense, I want to say. Mm -hmm. So I would think, and offense at the same time. So I would think if you're an uh, advancing force, that's a pretty good advancing dinosaur to lead with. I wonder if any, do you think any of the pterodactyl -y bird ones? Do you I don't think know how any they can those, do a support. Yeah, can they carry somebody? Because I had. I don't know. I had dino riders as a kid. Mm -hmm. And there was a pterodactyl. Yeah. And he had. Were those the ones that transformed? No, into... they don't transform. They, oh, okay. they were just like dinosaur toys. And then yeah. you clipped laser guns on them. Oh. And dudes rode on them. Oh. There's a brontosaurus that was a base. See, I don't know what the balance point is on a pterodactyl. Like, if, if the it... pterodactyl can carry my fat butt, mm -hmm. I really doubt it. I don't know. I don't. Well, know you weren't the average World War One soldier. Oh yeah, it's true. So it'd be more like me. Right. I bet a pterodactyl could carry you. Well, how big is a pterodactyl? I don't know. I don't even know if pterodactyls are a real thing. It's probably some archipoblepoplex or whatever. Yeah. 
I'm not, or do my, you try to go with more mobile forces? Like, I don't have any children, so like my dinosaur knowledge is only degraded every wait, time yeah, I have that reverse dinosaur spike. Didn't they figure out, um, not the T-Rex, but what's the the raptors? Didn't they figure out those weren't really what they had like in the Jurassic Park movies? That was figured out. That was never a thing. Yeah. They were never thought to be that size. That's, that's, like that's, really that's pure important. movie like garbage. They're, they're supposed to be tiny, right? And then there's that cope of like, oh, but that's the Utah rapper. They just called it the Velociraptor. It's just a cope. It's and not, then like now they figured out like the T-Rex is a scavenger. That like totally blows everything. He has little useless arms. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah, with little tiny arms. Really useless tiny arms. Yeah. Like so, how does that become the development point of a creature where you have literally useless tiny arms? Just, just uh, evolution's weird. Yeah. So, um... What was I saying? Oh, I'd probably do like a pterodactyl in like a um, Winchester 1907. That'd be See, rad. I think you could mount machine guns to Triceratops and just like. Oh, oh yeah, you could totally do that. Just like become an all arching force, like freaking Avatar with that firebenders. Be like, okay, everything's just dead now. Yeah, but the problem is, man, just a good good volley of rifle fire would kill a Triceratops. They're not like that impervious to gunfire. Well, no, I, don't, I haven't really tested the Triceratops against gunfire. I'm sure they're I don't I'm know sure what they tough. can survive. I just feel like... Well, you, well, you presumably armor them. No, because then they're really slow. They don't have to be that fast. They just have to be f t the freaking tanks. Now i got to bleep that. Good job, me. You're not going to bleep all of them. No, I'm, I'm going to bleep at number 10. You're I'm not going to be them. able to get them armored enough. I think the easier way out is to go aviation and maneuverability. Well, yeah, that's what I was thinking, trying to think of maneuverability. Like, what's the one that's got the weird, uh, ba like, bald head? What's that one called? I don't know, but... That's the one that rams right. things. That, like, I feel like you get shot the crap with him. He's got an exposed but underbelly. He, but he's, like, really fast. No, what's the Ankylosaurus, or whatever they call it now, because apparently I'm wrong on all dinosaurs. But yeah, all the dinosaur stuff I learned The really low-armored one. He might actually be bulletproof. What? The really low-armored guy with what? the spikes on the side. He's got a club tail. Oh, him. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. The what spiky is he boy. called? Yeah, spiky boy. The spiky boy. <laughs> <laughs> We're awful at dinosaurs. I mean, I mean, that's the problem. Is that also can they take riders? Like, I like your idea of the Triceratops and like raining down fire from the sky. Trying to get a lizard to do a thing is probably really hard. Yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, all the lizards I've known have been stupid. I mean, now you're going to get a bunch of comments of people's like, I trained my lizard to know it's me and sing yeah, the but it, ABCs. Yeah, train your lizard to turn left and turn right and stop on command, because that's really hard. I bet. Yeah. Anyway, keep going. They probably have to lead it of some sort. They're not lizards, they're dinosaurs. Oh my god. Or maybe they were smarter. We're getting dumber by a second, keep going. Okay. What is the most surprising thing you have discovered from your research? Crazy gun development story, a designer story, like... What? I think I, did I put a note on here? Oh yeah, you did. <laughs> I love that answer. Oh, yeah. Because no, yeah. you, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned this before with... Yeah, but you say your thing. What? What have you discovered? Oh, what have I discovered? Because you don't really research like I do, so you just experienced the firearms. Was anything surprising? I just... I was so surprised at just the stories of, like, people like Colt, like, the inventor. And... Because you told me this story no, about... you're stealing my thing. I'm talking about the firearms. What? Oh, no, I'm not stealing your thing. Like, I don't, not that, not that That's thing. what I'm talking about. No, that's not what you're talking about. What okay, I'm going to talk about is him, like, possibly, like, getting his brother out of jail and, like, lying about stuff with his wife and yeah, kid. Yeah, 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 but that's, 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 what, that's the same thing, I assure you. I'm talking about the firearms. Did any of the firearms surprise you? Like, any of the history or whatever? Just with anything you're like, this is not what I expected when I got into this. Uh, I don't know. I can't think of anything. I didn't... I got nothing. I'd say the Villa Perosa. Why are the Villa Perosa? Because I didn't expect it to be that incredibly uncontrollable, and we still haven't even oh. done the episode. Oh, yet. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about gun development or a designer story or stuff like that. Oh, I didn't wait, realize sorry. you were talking about... Gun yeah, gun development. Well, that's use. That's okay, actual stop. use. This question is tailored to me in the sense that it's research-based, right? Yeah. But I tried to apply it to you as in just say something about the guns. I was trying to give you something to talk about. Oh, you about didn't tell me like not about not the history. I or did say that multiple times. Oh I said, tell God. me about the guns. What surprised you to give you a hook to start this? And I didn't I... know you weren't still referring to the history oh or whatever. God, everybody. They were already off the rails. Anyway. Um, yeah, no, the Villa Prosa was a weird one. Like I wasn't expecting that use of it. The fact that the recoil. Well, we actually haven't even really shown. We haven't done the episode, segment. but that is the most uncontrollable gun. Ian did his episode. It is the most uncontrollable gun. Yeah, so, it really was crazy. Um, um, but this is about history and development. Right. So now I'm going to answer it properly. I was just trying to give you a tone. Well, I didn't know. Well, I front loaded everything in the research department. Yeah, so I know. You, you screwed so me. I didn't. See, you get more at the end. I just were. It's taking a while. Um, uh, rampant narcissism is my answer. I tried um, to even answer that. I even said I was starting to go on about Colt. Right, because you're taking on my thing. 
You took my thing. I didn't know that was your thing. I thought you were going to talk about Verdan. Who is also rampant narcissist. <sighs> anyway. Much of gun development, like apparently everything that human endeavor has ever done, is driven by insane narcissists who just push and push and push and end up in charge of things. Like, and they mow people down in the process. It, they don't care. They it's just actually, keep going. It's been the most alarming thing that I've learned in my life because I try to be a very thoughtful person. I try to be very kind to the people I know. And it turns out that's probably why I'm failing. Like, I'm not, I'm not completely, like, I'm not a failure. We have the show. We have support. I love you all. But, like, I'm not, like, the world's most famous whatever. We're not a million-dollar company. We're none of that stuff, right? And I'm starting to realize that it, it almost demands that you be rampantly narcissistic, and I don't know if I have it in me to not care about you guys, so <laughs> I'll try real hard to be a bigger dick going forward because all of the most successful people are royal jerks, except for, like, maybe Browning? Like, he seems like a normal enough guy, but now I'm scared you that... Now you're, like, worried you're going to unearth something about Browning where it's, like, going right. to shatter your illusion of him. Every, every time I dig deep enough, they're just awful people. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of those things. Well, they're just really hyper focused. The one hit wonder guys tend to be pretty cool. Like when you actually look at their lives, you're like, oh, okay. Or the support guys, like the engineers that are often responsible for a lot of the real work, yeah. are really cool guys. Um, like you see, like William Whiting seemed like a decent dude. Um, but then the actual personalities is like Charles Ross was a maniac. Oh yeah, Colt I mean, I love the stories, but she. Hiram Burdan was. Awful person. Yeah. And then, um, what was the other one uh, more recently? Fosbury. Not necessarily an awful person. I mean, he may or not have been an awful person. I don't know. But didn't count his pennies and pretended to be wealthy when he wasn't? Like, just all sorts of weird, crazy, mm -hmm. like, just, just the... Just complete bluffs and yeah. narcissistic the amount of, like, bullishness. And, yeah. It's really weird. Yeah. It's a bit strange. So, uh, step one. Lie, cheat, steal, and take care of number one. Congratulations. <laughs> A successful gun production. Yeah. <sighs> All right, let's take a pause. Okay. All right. Uh, what were your favorite books you've come across while researching? What's your do you have one? Um, well, some of my favorites might be more tailored to I just thought they were pretty. Yeah, anyway. Like I like that um the Austria Hungarian book that we got you way back in the day before we started the series. I think we briefly talked about it. Yeah, this one we're talking about the ones full of Mon Licker's patents. Yeah, I don't remember the name of it. But it's just it's massive like and it's gorgeous. From... There's wonderful drawings in yeah. it. Um it's literally just a German language collection of his patents. Mm -hmm. Um That's been one of my favorites just because of how beautiful it is. Probably the most influential rifle or, uh, book that I ever got was um Bolt Action Rifles of the World. Oh, yeah, that was, like, one of the first ones. That book. Although we need to get another copy. Yeah, I've had three copies, and I let people borrow them, and I never get them back, and now it's worth money. Yeah. And, like, I keep... It's awful. Stop so, giving them away. <clears throat> I loan people things, That's and they disappear. That's what happened to our P14 book. Oh, my God. That P14 book, I loaned it out, and it didn't come back, and now I looked, and it's, like, $700 for another one. Yeah. And I'm just like... Anyway. So, <clears throat> it wasn't when I bought it. Um, so, uh, probably my favorite, though was uh, Bolt Action Military Rifles of the World is probably most influential on me. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a perfect book by any means, but what it did very well is that it gave a broad overview and it did it very beautifully and uh, it was unified. Mm -hmm. So when you went from chapter to chapter, it was a consistent theme, a consistent comparison between the guns. Um, <clears throat> very clear. Mm -hmm. It rang like a bell. And I think that gun did not, that book gun, that book did not have the depth that I needed. You know, it, it was very light reading, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> it was cursory reading on a lot of topics back before there was a lot of internet support for this. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. And it just, it, and I think it, it, it I th went into some rifles that weren't all too common either. Right. Well, what it did is it was a book that wasn't afraid to have. Just a pile of bolt action rifles, right? Um, actually, it, it, it just it didn't have to ring with all this like machine gun, whatever. It just could be just bolt action rifles. There are minor differences. Often the differences are just markings, mm -hmm. and yet it was fascinating and beautifully put together. And I think that was probably the first inspiration point that really sold me on doing CN Arsenal was seeing a book like that and being like. I, I want to put together something as nice as this, but I want more depth. Mm -hmm. And so I started article writing, and I was always trying to achieve photography or unification of vision that, or design vision, rather, 
that at least was comparable to that book. Mm -hmm. And then when we did the video series, the same thing sort of came over. Like I wanted to see the guns rendered beautifully. And so that's where we are today. I think that's the yeah, most influential one. That's fair. You also made a note down here. Apparently, you really enjoyed that Mosin book. It gave you a satisfying answer. Oh, my God, yes. Because at the start of all this, I got really into looking into gun research because um, I couldn't get any answers on to why the Mosin Nagan was the way it was. Because this is my first rifle was the Mosin Nagan. Mm -hmm. And I had there's absolutely no satisfactory answer to why it was assembled the way it was assembled. Until I believe it's, I want to say it's Chumac is the way to pronounce his name. Or Chum, I can't remember. Nah, it. I don't it's all Russian. in Cyrillic, but it's a the uh, I believe it's Chumac who did the, like, a Russian language Mosin Nagan book. I had to translate it from Cyrillic. It's very difficult to sort of make my way through this horrible automated translation, but it didn't matter because it established what was happening in the thought process mm -hmm. and and what the sort of creep was in the design. And then now even more so, understanding the Burdan a little bit better that I do. Um, I really see where the Mosin came from in terms of being an obsession with the cartridge and barrel first and then building an action around that and then slapping a magazine on the action. It really starts to make you go, oh, this happened very ad hoc. Because you think of the Mosin, you think of the, you think of the short magazine, you think short magazine Lee Enfield, you think of it as an ad hoc gun that was built over stages and stages and stages. Mm -hmm. But the Mosin is the same thing, but done way closer together and all in pre-development and with this weird bias towards that's not important. What's important is we've already been doing it for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And you're like, but it's, it's worse and we're going to start doing it for 10 years. No, 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 we're not going to change it now. And it's just like, uh oh, and it just like it just stacks horribly because it's not it's it's like production stacking and weird priority stacking versus, you know, doing something going out there and be like, uh, it's not quite as good as we want. Let's change it. it. It's like take that process and just change all the objectives and make them really compact and you get the mo's in. It's really bizarre. But I really like figuring that out. Fair. Um, let's see, next question. Are you aware of any other books or other documents on any other classic firearms in English or otherwise that go into engineering detail? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sure there are some, but the problem is I don't, the way this question was asked, it was more of like the manufacturing engineering, like the mm -hmm. actual machine tool. And there's a few good documents that he listed. Um, if you find that question, he, it was a bigger paragraph of documents. Um, and they're, they're good resources. The problem is we don't often describe every single cut of the gun. So when I see those resources, I don't often log them very well. Um, generally though, I only find them in, uh, equivalents to what you would think of as scientific American in various countries. Mm -hmm. So, um, a good place to look would be like the BNF uh, in France has a digital archive and they have a uh, review the artillery. And they have a lot of technical discussion of firearms from that period, and sometimes they talk about that. Um, there's also a Civil Engineering Magazine. can't remember the name of it, but you can find it in... Yeah, you wrote like two down on here. Oh, uh, is it? Let me see. Uh, no. Um, there was a user, by the way, that commented on this and said that Neil Appenshaw's new Martini book has more manufacturing detail than usual. Hmm. Um, but I have not dug that deep into that book. But... A review to artillery is a good one to check out if you're kind of curious about some of this. But in terms of pure depth, you kind of have to get lucky and find like a trade journal that was discussing a particular process. I know there's some documentation of like the Peabody Martinis being constructed and how they were constructed. Mm -hmm. I can't remember where I saw that, though. It was just one of those weird trade journals, you know. Fair. Um, good resources for this is Hathi Trust and the BNF. Uh, both of which have good digital resources for finding these old sorts of trade journals. Sure. All right. Uh, what do you do if you can't find a proper book for researching a particular firearm? I it's in a foreign language or not easily Googleable. Uh, you watch the NRSL. What do you do? Oh, what do I do? Yes. Uh, well, if it's in a foreign language, we use an OCR software and then we translate it. Like right. It's very difficult and it takes but a lot of time. If you can't find the book that you need for the episode, we don't, we don't do the, the episode. episode. Yeah, it just doesn't happen until there's, you get the book. There's been a lot of that. Yeah, we're still trying to get a hold of two right I've, now. I finally feel like I can at least try to talk about the Burdan rifle, but there still isn't really a Burdan rifle book. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm missing a lot of detail. And I'm going to have to caveat that at the beginning of that episode. I'm going to have to be like, guys, uh, there's not this a direct... This might get a redo one day. I'm, I'm working at this very tangentially. I'm pulling out 
details about the Burdan that are mentioned in works that are much more grandiose in terms of their design, their, their purposes. Mm -hmm. And so like, I'm going to have to get it wrong. Like I'm going to tell you as much as I know. And a lot of it's not going to be dead on because no one sat down and compiled that. I'm not a direct researcher. Um, and so I'm very limited. Mm -hmm. We're finding that with the shotgun series. Most of the shotguns don't have books about them. No. So we're having to go through period documents ads and what we're gonna have to do is do a very light show because we can't do all the shotguns to primer depth some mm -hmm. we can some we can't so we're gonna have to make that series fit the amount of information we can reliably get for each shotgun and then that's gonna be how it is until somebody gets down and starts doing real deep research mm -hmm. yeah sucks but that's what it is yeah i unfortunately don't have the time to do real deep research not I, with that rotation schedule. I I want to point out, I bless the guys who do. Because they do it in their spare time as a passion, and they almost never recoup their money. Like, mm -mm. And, and even if they recoup their money, it doesn't pay for their time. I, I genuinely love the researchers, and I really think we should all... I really want to find a way to make sure that they're at the forefront of this more so than even myself. But I have yet to figure out how to do that. Fair. Um Next question kind of is about books as well. Uh, where are some decent places to find reference books that don't cost like $200? Not Amazon. No. Um, Amazon usually has speculators in it. Uh, eBay is a good place if you know how to search for what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Make sure you always know the actual ISBN of the book you're looking for because that'll help you find it a lot easier. True. Library where you can get some free books. Uh, that's a big one. And I've had to do this with a couple people. Um, I want to look at this book, but it's $1,000. Chances are it's somewhere in the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. you, if you're the kind of person that really wants to read deep and you don't want to spend money, it is time to get to know your local librarian. They are genuinely helpful people. Yeah. I've heard of a few that are lazy. Sure. Like anything else. But if you can find a librarian that will work with you, they have the resources to request that book just about anywhere in the entire country, if not the world. It might take time right. to get in, but... But I've definitely had a couple volumes now that were absolutely unobtainium to me, no matter how much money I had. And I was able to get them out of the library network by an especially competent librarian who was willing to even go to bat and say, I don't care if you say you don't have it. I know you have it. Mm -hmm. So librarians are super useful. Oh, yeah. And then Abe's books. Yeah, check out. Like, there's alternative sites like Abe books and stuff. Just try to find other book sites that are not Amazon. And yeah. That helps a lot, too. Um, let's see. What are some, I'm guessing, guns that uh, I gave a hard no to, but are some of my favorites? Oh, you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so this is going to sound strange. So stuff like uh, Remington Rolling Blocks, um, the French, I'm thinking like probably 1915. Did you ever want to fight with one? No, never. Not in my life. But it's so kinesthetically pleasing yeah. to just open that action, like the click click and then popping that breech back. Like, yeah, I'd love to. I don't have one, but I'd love to have one in 7mm just to shoot. Yeah, it's just, they're fun. They're just pleasant feeling. Um, I'm trying to think of what got nose. I mean, well, so rice revolvers got nose, but I find them stupid hilarious. Like the 79 is stupid Yeah, but you don't want to go shoot it. No, I don't necessarily want to shoot that one all day. I, I enjoy shooting black powders. Yep. Uh, they're really fun. They're A relaxing. lot of single shot black powders are just pleasant. Yeah, they're just nice to shoot. Um, you know, I uh, I think we technically gave the Webley Fosbury. Yeah, we had the Webley Fosbury, no, but I enjoyed shooting that. It was fun and weird. Super fun and weird. Right. <laughs> but um, I guess there's some of the big ones that it's I can think of. It's a lot of them that really aren't good for war, but are more fun for just having Having around. fun with, yeah. Yeah. It's like... Danish Crag, not the best, not the worst, but yeah. for shooting, so fun. super fun. Yeah. yeah. Did you have any? Uh, that we gave hard nose to? I didn't know if you That's wanted... It's actually really hard for me to think about it. I know, because like a lot of them we gave a lot of like soft yeses to. Did we to... give a hard no to the, to the Frommer Stop, or did we just were we completely baffled by it? I can't remember. Frommer Stop's a cool time. little gun. It is really rad. Unnecessary. Completely Beautiful. unnecessary for 32 ACP. No. Yeah. So... Yeah, there's one. I don't know. There's a number of them like that. Yeah. Oh, I know. Um, trench guns. Like, they, they're one of those things. It's not that we said no. no well, we did to the Remington. Mm -hmm. But then to the Winchester, it was kind of like, it depends. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What am I using it for? Because it's like, if you tell me I only have one long arm, it's not going to be a shotgun. Right. But I love 
Oh guns yeah, I love clay. shotguns. Boy. Like we've shot, we've just. Well, I have. mean, to be fair, I've just had range days where I'm just throwing clay. Shotgun might be the coolest gun that you don't really want to be your only gun. Yeah, it's pretty rad. Okay. Um, let's see here. What if any guns uh, I have given a yes to that I don't like or think are overhyped? Mm. Oh, I'm trying to think about that one. Um, We're really pretty careful to contextualize the hype on your guns. Yeah, the thing is, like, I I can't say. I'm trying to think of any that I just absolutely disliked that I had to give a yes to. Like a solid yes to or overhyped yes to. I know what I would say. What would you say? I'm going to still think about mine for a second. Luger. The, the, the value on them, like there's so many in the market and yet they're so expensive. C96 and yet, for me would be that respect then. Yeah. yeah C96 oh, yeah. is super overhyped and then it's like. It's terrible oh, as a pistol. God, it sucks as a pistol. I think I gave it a no as a pistol, but a yes as a carbine, which right. I think I still stand by. But they they are overhyped in the market. People love them. Yeah. I Luke, hate shooting them. The cost, like Lugers are neat. They're super neat. I'm just not enamored with them. They're mechanically finicky. In mm -hmm. the it's not the toggle. Everybody gets into the toggle. It's the, it's the, it's the um, trigger because the trigger turns that ninety degrees on the, the transfer tip or bar mm -hmm, thing. Yeah, so just and like so many of them I know have had to be retuned because of that. Um, they're they're nice one handed shooters with a detach detachable mag. That part works fine, but the actual work in the toggle is a little bit of annoying. This mm -hmm. I don't like how it goes up and over center. Yeah, like it's just weird and it's not as nice as. Everybody's like, the Luger. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, it's like, for World War One, it's it's the 1911 and the Luger. And that's everybody thinks of those as the two handguns right off the bat, right? And the thing is, the 1911, we haven't done the episode yet, but the mm -hmm. 1911's earned that. Yeah. In terms of the context of the guns that were available at the time, the 1911 is actually phenomenal for its time. And there's things about it that are very weird that we think of as normal because of it. But the Luger... Everybody puts it on a pedestal, and then nothing really was borrowed from it except its cartridge. Mm -hmm. And the cartridge is borrowed because it's reasonably powerful, and it fits in a grip that fits in your hand. And then the C96 is just a bizarre, weird pistol that's no, triple clip fed. Any and... mag forward pistol is going to be weird. Like, like I, I can't say I had a fun time shooting it. Realistically, it was interesting to try, but its when practicality I, is just not there. Yeah, when I think of the ergonomics of the Luger, I just prefer a Lottie. Yeah, I could see that. Looks like a Luger, sure. works way cooler. Looks like a space gun. Yeah. So, all right, what up? Oh, let's see. Uh, what's the absolute worst possible loadout that still gets a yes or the best possible loadout that still gets a no? Oh, God. Do I have notes on that? Uh, no. <laughs> Let me see this. What's the... What do you mean by loadout? Hold on. Yeah, what does he mean by loadout, actually? That's a good question. Like, are you talking about... What you as an infantryman have? <sighs> Problem is, this would break down into rifles, pistols, machine guns, whatever. I'm thinking, let's let's get into. Because I'm trying to think of what he means by that. If we're like, talking about like a, if it's like a rifle, the worst possible loadout in terms of series of features would be guns that don't have any sort of rapid loading technology. Yeah. So what, like single shots? No, no, no. Like magazine guns that don't have stripper clips. Oh, okay. So, like, the crag. So, like, the crag is probably one of those worst possible that still gets a yes-ish. I guess so. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's always the loading thing that really ties us up. I mean, they up. had, they had the, the, the clip loaders, but those weren't until much later on. Right. And then we have, yeah, I think the crag would be, like, a sign of that thing where it's, like, you don't have the speed loading, but everything else is really good, but it's a little expensive. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then, like, the best possible loadout that still gets a no there's been a couple of those, but the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to think of like. Loadout still gets a yes, but okay, still gets a no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, it's really cool, but it still gets a no. Um, There's been a couple of those. Um, what was that uh, rifle that had like a dual ladder, where it's like the ladder extends out again to give you like twenty over two thousand meters? It's like like what the Kaver eighty eight. I can't remember what it was. Yeah, no, no, no. Where it like it pops up, like where it's like you flip it up to get a oh, longer range, and then pull it up oh, again. No, it wasn't a single shot. Um, <laughs> oh God, now I can't remember. Well, wait, was it the? It wasn't the rolling. The rolling block was it? Was the rolling block. I think so. Maybe. maybe. But it, again, <laughs> it's like with the best possible loader that still gets a no. What puts you below no? Would be not having a magazine. Like, being a single shot gives you a no, and there's yeah. some pretty sweet ones, but even then, I think there's still way no. 
And then stripper clip loading any pistol. You can get you can get a yes and not have speed loading. Mm-hmm. But how do you get a no as close to a no as possible? I swear we've had this answered before for us. It was very close for one rifle, and now I can't remember what it is, and the audience will remind me. It's going to drive me crazy because the car comments didn't fall below no. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of anything that's a magazine gun that fell below no. I think the Mosin. Was it the Ross? No, I think it was the Mosin. You think it was the Mosin? The oh, Mosin, it might have been, yeah. Mosin was the best possible gun that still got a no. And the reason it got a no was your trust. Right. There was which, not full trust with that which guy. Which the belief was you could get a good one and you'd be fine. But if you got a bad one. You'd be exhausted working it. Right. So the problem for you is like there's a version of the Mosin where I'd rather have, like the Mosin has speed loading, but I'd still rather have a crag. Mm-hmm. That's weird. Yeah. That's weird that you would rather have a crag than a Mosin, because on the numbers, the Mosin should be better. I think that's where we're at. I think the Mosin and the crag best represent this sort of, like, I bet. Weird and by the way, both could go either side way. Side of the playing field, to, yeah. to your preference, you could say, no, I would trust a Mosin, but not a crag. Mm-hmm. And so this is more subjective. But I think that's the closest we're going to get to this answering this question. Probably. Those two. It's been a while. Yeah, I think that was probably it. Yeah. And, uh, ooh, we got we to take a pause. Okay. 